fortnightly column on world writing in the Assamese Tribune called Loving Literature. Now, before we call him to give the uh, keynote address, I would like to request Dr. Christina. Are you there? Okay, before she uh, comes uh, and uh, do the felicitation for Professor uh, Bipash, uh, I would just like to announce that after this session, after the keynote uh, session is over, uh, the, uh, we would uh, like to inform all of us here that there will be a group photo outside. Okay, so all of us. Okay, it is not outside, it will be taken in the hall. Okay. Yeah, there are still seats here in the front. Okay, so uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Christina. Uh, to do the honours to Professor Vipash Choudhury. Thank you, Dr. Christina. So, without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, call upon Professor Vipash Choudhury to give the keynote address. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, this is the second day of the seminar. Uh, so I am very privileged to be here in the presence of uh, invited guests, Professor Saki, uh, members of the faculty of the Department of English, other members of faculty of different departments, uh, research scholars, students, participants from different parts of the country and those who are present here. Um, yesterday, as uh, ma'am has just rightly stated, it was a wonderful day and we had uh, papers relating to disability and literature and of course uh, uh, related areas which uh, may not have been connected to them together but then they shed light on both the areas of disability and literature. Before starting, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, talk a little related to what we uh, make sense of, or how do we make sense of these two terms. And other term, which is not really a part of the title of the seminar, but uh, part of the discourse uh, when we think about these two words, disability and literature. There is a term called medical humanities, uh, as many of us are today aware. And this is uh, a term which is a kind of a misnomer in that medicine is supposed to be a very specialized discipline and a science, whereas humanities deals with uh, something that is considerably removed from the scientific mode of inquiry. So how did this medical humanities or the idea of medical humanities and the consolidation of it as a disciplinary area of study come about? And how does that enable us or uh, create for us the space to have a dialogue where we can think of disability and literature and culture as an area of study? So if we go to what we call medical humanities, uh, this is something that started in the medical sciences itself. It is not something that was initiated by people from the humanities. As the middle of the 20th century rolled on, uh, especially in terms of uh, research in critical diseases such as AIDS and cancer, it was gradually felt by people in medical sciences that there are certain aspects of these diseases which are not technically or clinically accessible and that there are elements of human behavior 
and human responses which are related to this developments in humanities, especially psychology. So that need was felt, especially in hospitals, in palliative care, that merely looking at patients or people who come with these illnesses uh, should be treated or responded to in terms of machines and how machines can deliver. But there is this other dimension which was considered to be humane and that needed to be factored in. At the same time, around 1980s, uh, one, one very landmark book was published, which is not related to disability, but related to illness, and which uh, was published by a non-technical person. She was Suzanne Sontag, and she published a book called Illness as Metaphor. It has a subtitle called AIDS and its Metaphors. How do people really look at illness? And when I went through the book, Illness as Metaphor, I found that the word disability was not mentioned. So one interesting development that happened in the 1980s in, in disability studies was that disability studies tried to look at human responses and social perceptions of disability. So a, a, a particular bifurcation took place where medical humanities emerged from the establishment of medicine, whereas disability studies emerged from the developments in the humanities and the perception of society relating to how people who are were considered to be disabled or not as able as normal people were, these are all used in quotes, how they were seen and how did this dialogue or lack of dialogue take place. So although we use sometimes, even in critical pedagogy, medical humanities and disability studies interchangeably, they're not exactly the same in terms of how they have emerged. And one very, very important thinker, Simi Linton, uh, she herself is uh, physically disadvantaged and she has contributed significantly to disability studies. Um, she wrote a book, I Write the Body Politic, and then she wrote a very, very influential essay called What is Disability Studies? And there she went on to ask the question about how do we really look at people who are disadvantaged and how do we respond to them in society, not only in literature, but in society. Then we have the other dimension, which is philosophical. When you look at disability in literature and culture, it, it involves a philosophical dimension, which was introduced and which was uh, dealt with and is being still being uh, discussed by a philosopher called Judith Butler. And this is the philosophy that concerns the idea of precarity how people who are disabled or disadvantaged are on the edge of society, that somehow they are occupying positions of marginality from which it's dif difficult to really take stock of what is going on in the idea of the mainstream. Now, when we come to these three parameters, these three, dif these three different segments, one is medical humanities, disability studies, and the study of illness, we find that it is literature which has been looking at these things, but not through these terminologies. If we go back to ancient Greek culture, for instance, and if we look at Sophocles' Oedipus, Oedipus Rex, uh, one of the great classics of world literature and of Greek drama and theater, we find that there is this blind man, Tiresias. This blind man, Tiresias, who warns Sophocles, who warns Oedipus, and Sophocles uses him as the seer, as someone who is the uh, person who can tell the future. The Tiresias, who is blind, who comes onto the stage, brought in by a young boy, and the Tiresias predicts the future, that this is what is going to happen to Oedipus. So this idea that if you are disadvantaged in some way, bodily, then you are advantaged in terms of what is considered to be insight. And this idea of blindness and insight 
on the title of one of the major books of post-structuralism that was written by Paul de Man. The book was titled Blindness and Insight. So the important question for us to look at is, is disability a form of illness? Now, the intersection that we can look at here is that society sometimes in its confusion tries to see both the disabled person and the ill person as being the outsider and respond to that person similarly by placing that play person on the edge of society that on the space of precarity. So we can find that how these three different segments of uh, disability, of illness, and of the question of precarity, how they are combined and how they are placed, they emerge in literature. In fact, if we, if we look at the major writers of the world in different languages, including English, we find that they come together in different ways. The interesting thing is that we have not been looking at them through these terminologies. We have been looking at, say, something like Shakespeare's King Lear or Macbeth's Witches as aberrations. And this is crucial because this idea of the aberration is connected to how the word disability has been appropriated in literary discourse. That someone is seen as an aberration, someone who is seen as outside the space of the normal. Now, when we say normal, this normal, as Professor Sati was yesterday, I happened to hear snatches of his lecture. He was talking of how certain things became normal post-COVID. So this idea of the normal is a very flexible and dynamic operative word. That what we call normal is something that is functional in terms of social imperatives. These social imperatives keeps on changing. And that is where culture come, comes in. Because when you look at culture, culture is not necessarily literary. It, it, it relates to how we respond, what our habits are, how we converse, and how we distance ourselves from some of our own fellow human beings. It relates to the situation of the body. Now I would like to draw your attention to the role of the body because disability is connected to the whole idea of a kind of fractured ablement. The, the idea of the able-bodied person and the disabled person is related to some, something that is missing, some kind of a void in the other person through which we look at the question of ability. Now, this incapacity of an individual in terms of functionality, in terms of perception of that functionality, is sometimes, not always, sometimes connected to how the body behaves, but always it is not connected to the body. And this is something which have, has occupied uh, people from literature, especially uh, in the theater, in fiction, in poetry, we find this figure of the aberrant individual, figure of the person who is a misfit, keep on, it keeps on coming again and again. If, if, we, if we look at something like um, John Milton's poem, his autobiographical poem called On His Blindness, where Milton talks about his own impairment, and this is a term I'm going to come to shortly, that he is uh, bodily impaired, that he doesn't have his sight. And we know that Milton uh, wrote uh, the major part, he conceptualized it and wrote the major part of his classic epic, Paradise Lost, when he was blind. So in a way, he was impaired. Now, in disability studies jargon, impairment is not considered to be a form of disability. Because impairment can have different medical reasons. Impairment may be related to something that has happened to a person suddenly, some kind of accident, or impairment may be uh, from the time of the birth. So there are certain areas where these terms like impairment, disability, and uh, illness uh, converge. And this is where, as students of literature and culture, we need to make, try to make sense of where to draw the line. 
For instance, there's this novel, I think students will be aware of that novel, it's called Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. In Mrs. Dalloway, we find that there is this character called Septimus, Septimus Grant Spit, who, because of his participation in the war, he's shell-shocked and he's short of hearing. And of course, he has a lot of problems in terms of understanding the world as the world is. So the Septimus Warren Smith that we meet in London after he, he comes back from war is a person with disability. And how does the disabled person look at the world and how does the world look at him? We go on to find in the novel that he ends his life because he finds himself to be a misfit. So the psychological dimension, and this is something which Susan Sontag talks about the question of illness and how illness can be overwhelming and it can lead to different forms of responses of the individual towards society. How this can actually emerge in sociological terms because the normal society has not treated the disadvantaged person as one of its own. So this marginalization that takes place where we look at the person who we consider to be disabled, how we look at that person and place that person on the outskirts of social normativity. This is something that Judith Butler considers to be very significant because it leads to the fractured nature of society in which we live. Now why is this idea of disability considered to be different from the idea of illness? is something that we see in the term or see in the development of what we call medical humanities. Now, when research in AIDS, cancer, and especially early in the 20th century in tuberculosis was going on, it was felt gradually that the diseases were not as simple as they could be treated through medicine or by clinical intervention, but they had certain factors which were not accessible to the medical personnel. So they realized that there was something in the human which needed to be addressed. And they realized that if we look at literature, culture, and human behavior and the humanities, I think some light can be shed on, on the dark spots of uh, medical science that could then enable them to address these illnesses better. And so there, there's a very, very interesting movement, one movement in, the other move out. The movement in was that in the medical humanities, the medical people started doing research in humanities so as to better understand the psychology and circumstance of the subject. So they were trying to look at the ground and the ground in which the human beings live, the culture, the habitat, the society, the family, the nature of relationships, how the person behaved, how was the person responded to, the neighborhood, the talk of the neighbors, the discourses. So it was a very ground-based study of the human condition through which they thought they'd be able to access the situation of this person who is suffering and for, who, for whom the medical intervention is not quite working. When you come to disability studies as a pedagogic uh, matter when you look at it as a discipline, disability studies, then it was more about the discourse. How is the discourse being worked out? So they they're, they're developed a sp space for discursive studies in terms of disability and its reception in literature. So when we look at medical intervention and when we look at disabilities and its reception in literature, if we go to a classic text like Frankenstein, we find that it's a very, very interesting text in the sense that we have here a creation which is created by a man called Victor Frankenstein who is on the uh, um, frontier of science, uh, especially in 19th century science, and he creates this creature in his lab, if we can call it, and then that person starts behaving on his own. But that person or monster as he has, as, or creature as he comes to be called, that creature is disabled in many ways. And that, that disability is something that disability studies would look at. That his disability in terms of he lacks a history, he lacks a genealogy, he lacks a society, he lacks a temperament. 
difficult to distinguish between a lot of things that human beings in society look at. Medically, bodily is fine. So disability is not always looking at the body as a site, disability studies, but is looking at the discourses that related to the person who is considered to be disabled or lacking in ability. And sometimes, that is why I, I, I use the word sometimes, sometimes they intersect and they come together because it considers something that is important to all of these three. It is the word life. How do these three, one who is ill, who is looking at recovery, one who is disabled, who is looking at life to be lived meaningfully, and of course the other, the doctor or the, or, or, or the, the establishment who is trying to look at these processes through some kind of intervention. Now I would like to here give an example, since I am looking at the local response, I'd, I'd like to give you an example of, of one particular story. I'll just give you the outline of the story and then try to see how all these three terms converge through that and how we get an idea of culture and our questions that relate to it. The sto story is called Encroach. It's a story, an Assamese short story. It's uh, called Encroach in English translation. And it's by a writer called Imran Hussein. The story is about a young girl. The story was published in 1994. Uh, it, it's about a young girl who is on her wheelchair. She uh, cannot walk. She has to be in her wheelchair. She lives with her mother and her grandfather. We don't quite know much about her family history, but we know that she is a young girl, uh, about eight, to 10 years, we don't quite know her age, but she lives with her grandfather and she keeps on looking outside the window. And outside the window, there's a tree, an old tree, and that tree is going to be cut down because the highway is going to be made. Now, what happens in the story is that this old tree man, the tree, appears to her in her dream and says, please save me. And so there are two kinds of ageists, people who are aging, okay? One is the old tree, which is the last remaining uh, plant resource out there because the highway is going to come, so the tree is going to disappear. And here you have the aged grandfather who tells her stories. So here we have the human, the natural, and the cultural because we have something called the storyteller. This young girl's repository, her cultural repository is through the stories that she has heard from her grandfather. Now, I'd like to break here and draw your attention to a, a, a brilliant anthology, uh, which I, I don't know how we place that, but it was an anthology published by Chicago University Play Press in 1997. It was called The Undead Storyteller. The Undead Storyteller, it was by Arthur Frank. You can check it out, Arthur Frank, The Undead Storyteller. Now in that book, which he calls part memoir and part anthology, because he, he talks about these, he, he brings there narratives of people who are disadvantaged bodily. So they find themselves disadvantaged bodily and he says there are two problems here. One, the problem of voice and the problem of the body. Because when we think of, and this is a very, very interesting point that he makes in his preface, when we think of a storyteller, it doesn't occur to us, is the storyteller able? We take it for granted that the storyteller is a very, very legitimate voice airing a particular narrative. Now what about the wounded storyteller, the storyteller who is wounded in, in the uh, conventional sense? So the storyteller now has to create a particular voice that would narrativize the experience of his or her bodily condition. And that voice may not conform to our canons of narrativity. 
that this is how you write a narrative, this is how you plot, this is how you create character, this is how you write about yourself or society. Those paradigms may not be at work when the wounded storyteller, because the wounded storyteller has to negotiate both the body and the voice. So in this story, to coming back to the story in Croach, this girl, young girl, who's called Bristy, Bristy in Assamese is rain. So this young girl who is looking outside and who has this old tree, the old tree talks to her in a dream and says, please save me. Can you save me because I am also going? And she sees in a dream that the tree comes and the tree comes beside her when she's sleeping and with the limbs cut. And tree appears to her to be like her grandfather. So the story here is, that's why I, I, I thought of the story, because the story here is not only talk, looking at literature and how literary representation of this disabled girl comes true, but it's also about how we are looking at culture and let's say the culture of development. Because the culture of development here is infringing upon natural space. And by doing that, it is also making a particular kind of narrative its reality. Because, because what we find in the story is the use of what we in literature call magic realism. So we have a fantasy taking place inside the story, a dream that takes place where this girl, Bristy, who stands for rain, and rain, of course, for fecundity, for fertility. And then this girl is having this dialogue with this tree, which is on its way out. Now, this disability, where culture is moving forward, where we have development, where we have progress, and where that is intervening and staking its claim upon space that does not belong to it. It's something that belongs to nature. Because the human encroachment of nature is creating a new kind of culture. And this is a narrative, a discourse that you have. What is this narrative? This narrative is the narrative of progress. So when that happens, what kind of society do we get? We are now looking at a diseased society. Because the girl, she doesn't quite know, but we know that in the story, there's a, there's, there, there's a description of an industrial site coming up. And that industrial site coming up also creates the uh, condition of acid rain. So when you have that, those developments taking place, which are human developments, which are human conditioned developments, they create a disparity. And they create a disparity between individuals because now there is this whole space being supposedly flattened between the have the haves and the have nots. And so if there is this road, if this highway is built, then of course there will be a lot of schools and there will be a lot of the other sites and, uh, and a lot of things will happen. This is the part of the development narrative, the progress narrative. On the other hand, this girl who is herself disabled and who reflects upon the nature of the crisis. She is helpless. She cries. She tells her grandfather, can't we do anything about the tree? Her grandfather says, no, we can't do anything about the tree. So this helplessness that, that comes, this, this voice, therefore, the voice of the person who finds himself or herself in that condition of disability, that voice is not the regular voice, even if it may appear to be a narratorial position. So this girl articulates the voice of the voiceless. And this voiceless character, that means voice in the sense that it is not impactful. The disabled voice is not imp impactful to enter the literary space and we count it mainstream. So if you look at the way we do literary criticism, the way we look at literature, if you look at the uh, writings of different writers, the great classics, this is what I have thought about. Say, if you look at King Lear, we look at it as a tragedy. We look at, look at it as a man who has fallen, a man who 
pays the price of his arrogance. Or if we look at the three witches, for instance, in Macbeth, or Tiresias in Oedipus the King, or if we look at the old man in T.S. Eliot's Geronsian, what do we find? We find that these conditions are marginalia, they are footnotes to a larger narrative. They are never at the center of the narrative. So the disability condition, even when it is represented in literature, is not at the center of the narrative. They happen to be conditions of human beings who form part of the society. So in that wounded storyteller anthology, in that wounded storyteller book, Arthur Frank tries to draw attention to this very condition. That why is disability narrative not part of the center? Why is it seen as, OK, that space is granted. Here are the people, and this is how they experience. And this is how the narrative works. There's a very important book on the body called The Body in Pain by Elaine Scarry. Now, if you look at that, that book, she, she, she talks about different kinds of pain, including the pain of the mind. Yesterday, there were, uh, I think there was a paper on schizophrenia on, on the idea of madness and how that is looked at. Now, what, what struck me is when we look at these terms like schizophrenia or highly technical medical conditions, which as people from humanities, we don't quite understand, are we making them uh, operate side by side? Are we looking at them to be interchangeable? Because uh, illness in disability studies is not considered to be a condition of disability. Illness is a condition of the body. In fact, uh, I remember uh, you know, Susan Sontag in her book, Illness as Metaphor, says that uh, there are two realms in which we live. One is the realm of the day, which is when our body is uh, so-called healthy, and the realm of the night, when our body is ill. Because that is the dark side. In fact, we cohabit both these spaces at different stages of our life. Sometimes we're ill, that's the dark side. We'd rather not see ourselves. And the day when we feel we are healthy and fine, and we have other things to do. So Simil Linton, in her essay, What is Disability Studies, points this out, that when we look at a person who is disabled, then that person will think about articulating the body. <coughs> so in On His Blindness, Milton articulates his body. So the body becomes the sight, the instrument, and also the vocabulary for the narrative. The language of the narrative is determined by the condition of the body. And when, when we come to something like this, especially in, in a story that I just referred to, a story like Encroach, you find that here it is the body, the body of the tree, the body of the girl, and the body of the grandfather. When the story ends, the girl finds the tree has been cut, it has been sawed, it took a whole day for the tree to be sawed, and she finds when she wakes up next morning that her grandfather was suffering from asthma, her grandfather is also no more. That's how the story ends. So this, this condition of pain which is inarticulable, which cannot be articulated, and this is the point that Arthur Frank was making, that how do you give voice to that experience, which people who are normal cannot understand. Because the pains that the normal people would talk about would be pain about relationships, pains, pain about success, pain about failure. But this bodily pain, this, this inability to articulate, is conditioned into the mind of the person who is disabled. And we also know. And this is something she has written in her book, that this is something which we also know that when we look at someone who is writing about the body, there are many things which remain unstated. So it, it's not a narrative choice, as Hayden White, for instance, says, that when, when, when a writer writes, whether a historian or a novelist, 
a process selection takes place. The narrative in disability study is a person who is writing about a disabled condition and that is the source of the narrative. Then it is not merely a narrative choice, but an existential choice made by the narrator. This is a very, very important distinction. So when we go to something like medical humanities, we look at medical humanities and the interventions that take place from the knowledge of human sciences, then that is moving on a different tangent from what we call disability studies. Because in disability studies and literature, we are primarily looking at discourses and narratives that relate to this experience. Whereas in medical humanities, it is the other way around. It is something that emerged from the uh, developments or the roadblocks faced by the medical sciences. It then went on to look at the war wounded because uh, there, was the, there was the Vietnam War and a lot, lot of people came back from Vietnam War with different kinds of, this is the term being used, different kinds of impairment. And there's been great, great studies on specific cases where people have looked at forms of impairment brought about by war or conflict. Now, what, what we must understand, and I think this is something which as people from humanities, it's a responsibility to look at is how these forms of impairment need a particular kind of language. There was a clinical psychologist called Oliver Sacks. And Oliver Sacks wrote a very, very now famous book. It is uh, uh, one of the nonfiction bestsellers. Uh, the name of the book was The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And uh, th there is this uh, uh, entire narrative in mental studies uh, where Oliver Sacks is, uh, some people like him, some don't, but the whole idea that he was trying to project was that here is this man who has a consciousness failure. And so he cannot quite distinguish because of an impairment of his brain, he cannot distinguish between the human and the non-human. Okay, so in, in medical humanities, this is something that they debate. But how do we really understand this problem from the medical point of view? This is not then seen something to be looked at purely, merely from the medicine point of view. And if, if you look at this example of this man who mistook his wife for a hat, you see that here is the convergence of all three. It's a kind of illness, it's a kind of disability, his inability, incapacity to communicate, and here we find the role of narrative. Normally we feel as students of literature, and this is something which we take as a given, that the narrator has great power, that there is power of narrative. But what if the narrative cannot even take place? What if that narrative is conditioned by something that cannot be articulated? And that lack of articulation, where you cannot articulate, when you have to borrow terms that do not belong to your experience, it is then when impairment enters the realm of narrative. It is called narrative of impairment. And this narrative of impairment may not be conditioned always by awareness of disease. And let me again try to make this distinction. When we write something, Say you're a poet, you're a novelist, or you're an essayist. Um, we normally face what can be called writer's block. That I'm trying to write something, and I don't really get the words. That's a different condition. That's maybe some kind of uh, roadblock that I face in marshalling my thought process or creativity, and I, but it'll come. When it is, a narrative of impairment and when my impairment is affecting my narrative that's a different condition because the creative condition is different from the condition that is born out of my inability to articulate so if i have limited vocabulary we we have uh, narratives like that where we have <coughs> narratives of that that relate to autism for instance how do I really, because I have limited vocabulary, I cannot articulate, 
and I cannot also respond. Then we have characters in fiction, in literature, where there is this refusal to articulate. If you look at Dostoevsky's The Underground Man, he refuses to articulate. So is, is disability, is disability brought about by this gap in narrative orientation? Or is narrative orientation something that we take for granted, which he tries to impo impose upon what he call the disabled condition? I think these are important questions for us to consider. I'd like to take one more example, a very familiar example, which, which you're all aware. It's the play Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. And if you look at the play, we, of course, conventionally look at that as an absurd play, a play that deals with the condition of existentialism, question of existence, the meaninglessness of life. But if you look at it from a disability studies paradigm, and if you try to now use that lens and try to look at Vladimir and Estragon or someone like Lucky, then you see that things emerge different. Because we can see something here that can be considered to be a social disease. That there is some kind of a disabled society at work from which they are outside. Or we can say that they are positioning themselves on the edge of that society. So their condition can be seen as conditions of precarity. And at the same time, they can be seen as be suffering from, because the society would not treat them as normal. So purposelessness, when there is lack of purpose, because the person who is inside a particular space, say inside uh, uh, the hospital room, Joanne Didion wrote about this before she died of cancer. She wrote about how she spent her one year in the hospital. And, and she, uh, she, she talks about how different ideas came to her uh, no, so how do you look at this constricted space? This is something which you call agoraphobia, the fear of open spaces, that I can't go out because I'm conditioned to find myself here. So in Waiting for Godot, we find these characters who are somehow unwilling to articulate or interact with society. So, so here, things are placed to us on the other side of the mirror. It's a reverse mirror where we don't get society. We get these two characters as a norm. But the message that comes across is that they are not the norm. So even by being absent, the condition of ability, the condition of a functioning society is present in Waiting for Godot. So when you look at it through the lens of disability, what you find here is a picture of a society that's fractured, that's broken, and that is lacking in purpose. So in some ways, this whole political exercise that we find in different times in history, where people who are not considered to fit, to be, to be fit to live in that society, the Naji experiment, the Idi Amin experiment, we find this in history that segments of society are considered to be outside its realm the Black Lives Matter movement, we see that people are ostracized, isolated, sidelined, because they're considered to be incapacitated by whatever and not part of the normal theory or rational of progress. These are very, very important questions for us to consider, because as students of literature, I think we have had and we always have the greatest access to writings across disciplines. Because we, we, we can refer to historical narratives, we can refer to medical narratives, to some, some which we have access. So, so in a way, our range of operation as students of literature is wider than those who are operating in specialized disciplines. Because <clears throat> this is what makes it even more incumbent upon us and enhances our responsibility to look at and respond to 
and try to, first of all, I think our duty is to create that space for articulation for that person, not to be seen as other. Similington made that point that it is very easy to see the disabled as the other, that I am able and the other is disabled, so I have to be responsible. So she says disabled people don't need empathy. Because empathy is something that is imposed and projected and placed. What they need is a space to articulate and to give recognition to that articulation which may not conform to our, our understanding of what we call literature. So not to be seen as a specialized body of work, a particular work or a particular kind of narration, which is okay, give them that space. It's not something to be scheduled for them, but something that draws them in and makes part of that society fabric where their conditions are recognized. So in a way, we are now looking at the possibility or feasibility of revising our idea of the mainstream, what we call mainstream, what we call the main current, because outside of main current is, is these other spaces. They are othered because the mainstream have, has no space. And even when there is a space, say, say for example, we have the stairs and we have the ramp, so we don't have as many ramps as we have stairs because that's something which okay this is for you the rest is for us so this narrative is something that we need to look at and look at how our understanding of representation by people who are able and people who are not how they actually shed light on how we can respond to these developments in society in fact in in recent years there have been a lot of non-fictional work uh, on uh, disease, uh, in fact, fictional work as well, uh, which look at how the ill person is seen by society. But I don't think as much work has happened, or especially in, in literary space, that look at the condition of disability, other than seeing them as other. We always see them as other. There may be 10 stories, and one story may be about a person who is uh, not really developed in the mind or has some kind of uh, disability. That occupying maybe one marginal space, but the rest are about all the people. So health is the norm. And, and if what, what the disability studies uh, people are arguing for is not to give us equal space. So they are not asking for space in that sense. They are saying, please listen to us. Please listen to us in the way we speak, not in the way you expect us to. So I think I'll end my talk here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think we have been very fortunate to have the best uh, keynote address in this uh, seminar. Uh, today we uh, listened to the need for a particular language, whether it is literary, medical, or psychological. So uh, now we can have the uh, questions, comments, or whatever. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I think all of us are right now recovering. Maybe I should just, uh, a quick comment, perhaps also a question. Uh, one, one particular novel that I was reminded of was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where a certain part of the brain is removed for controlling emotions. So uh, perhaps, uh, maybe can we just look at it through the lens of disability and also uh, a way of uh, combating disease or perhaps a medical intervention? Yeah, I, I, it's difficult to say actually because uh, that was what I was uh, thinking of that normally we use these uh, categories interchangeably um, as, with, as it would suit our critical purpose. So if I'm writing a paper, I'd say if, uh, if, I'm to look, if I'm looking at it as a disability studies text, I say, I can use that, or sometimes I would use that as an illness or something where medical intervention is playing a part. 
So I think the role of the critic or the reader becomes even more important that we at least try to distinguish these spaces which are not always synonymous. That was what I was trying to say. Yes, that is, uh, uh, that is of course, that, that is something which is part of uh, this uh, discourse. Uh, so, uh, you have said that uh, Frankenstein is in some way disabled, right? Uh, Pardon? Uh, you have said that, you know, Frankenstein is in some way disabled, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, by inferring to Frankenstein the novel, uh, do you mean to infer that uh, society perceives disabled as synonymous to uh, the concept of monster? Uh, no. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> Actually, when I was referring to Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein is the name of the man who creates the creature. He's called the creature in the uh, novel. So the creature is seen as uh, disabled by Victor himself. And uh, that disability, he doesn't quite use the terms we use now, but he's seen as imperfect or not normal, an aberration. Uh, it is because he doesn't have a family history, he doesn't have uh, a neighborhood, a society, he doesn't have the psychology, he also doesn't have the understanding, uh, the humanity. So in that sense, disability is seen as a lack, which the normal would say, no, this person doesn't belong to us, this person is not part of our society. In that sense, the creature is lacking in ability in certain respects, though not bodily. I was trying to make a distinction that disability is not always confined to the body. Okay, good morning, sir. Uh, firstly, I would like to assert that that was a thorough and well-structured presentation. As a self-proclaimed writer, uh, I would like to ask uh, how can authors, scholars, and researchers uh, ensure authentic and diverse portrayals of disabilities in books and texts, uh, fostering a more inclusive representation of disabled experiences? Because, sir, earlier you mentioned that uh, persons with disabilities are never at the center of the narrative, and also um, you talked about the rule of narrative. Uh, how do we form that rule of narrative? Uh, thank you. Uh, usually what happens is that uh, in disability narratives, uh, you find a lot of what belongs to what we call life writing. They, they write about themselves, their disabilities, even if, even if they're, when they're fictionalizing. So it's born out of their own experiences. Uh, so, in a way, they feel, uh, from what I have read a uh, little, that they are considerably authentic in what they represent, whereas people who are not and who deal with it are primarily using perception about disability. And of course, we know that there are certain writers who do a lot of research. And it, this is something which is very important. How do we really bridge that gap? that uh, between the subject and the narration. Because narrative agency is sometimes inadequate, which um, when it comes to dealing with specialized experiences or conditions. Uh, we have to rely on medical literature, we have to rely on certain discourses, certain technical things about which we don't quite have knowledge. And a person who has gone through it will of course be able to say things which even people from the outside will not be able to communicate. So I, I, I think uh, one, one thing that has happened because of this is we are finding a lot of medical people, people in, in medical sciences uh, writing nowadays, non-medical books, books which are not specialized and technically uh, rooted for the general audience. And, and it, is, it is, I think, their contribution which has led to a better understanding of disease, of disability, of illness, and of course human responsiveness. I think, I think because of the knowledge of the body and uh, how the body suffers and how they're communicating and bringing it here, 
for people like us who don't have that knowledge to understand and see. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, there's a dialogue taking place. But I think uh, it's something which is developing and we'll just see how it goes. Uh, so, I, it's a, a bit of a personal question, but I am a parent of a disabled child. So, um, you were talking about waiting for Godot and that in the background we have this idea that, you know, the quote-unquote, the normal society is there, the overarching story in the background. So, usually, uh, you know, I have people who are absolutely empathizing with me, like, you know, or they will use words like, oh, it's such a pity that you have to have a child who is this. And then there will also be the narrative of the, you know, the self-righteous Christian, you know, like, oh, it's a, uh, the child is a blessing and then they become very empathetic and things like that. So my question is from the academics, when we talk about disability studies, the focus is on the disabled. So can you just, uh, you know, help me articulate uh, as a student of disability studies and as a parent also, uh, where does this figure in, you know, this uh, the cultural and the, so the social uh, narrative, like it's coming from the ableist extension, but how do we articulate that, you know, the language? I don't understand where that fits in into the disabled because we talk about the disabled um, body and their difficulty in articulating their pain. But on the other hand, the other uh, ableist narrative, so can you just help you articulate where that comes yeah, from? I, I, thank, <laughs> thank you. I think, I think you, 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 you have faced it, uh, you have been through it. Uh, I think this is one of the problems that disability studies people uh, talk about. Most of these people that I have referred to, Arthur Frank, and they are themselves disabled. So they are writing from a position where it is difficult for uh, them to make others see what they are going through. So, when it comes to a person who cannot articulate, or as a parent you cannot articulate what you have been feeling to the other, then you have to walk through the available vocabulary. And, and somehow make use of that vocabulary to communicate to the other, because the other yeah, be, be, yeah. You, you are you are sometimes in this world, and when you go home, you are in that world. Okay, so so these intermingling spaces, I think, which you occupy as a parent and then as an academic, and there's some sometimes you're also looking at it from a distance because of because you have been you have been a student of literature. But this is where this question of um, emotive responsiveness comes in. I think I think this is where. Um, it's, it's difficult for somehow, this is uh, what I've been uh, reading, that it's difficult for the other, that is the so-called normal person, to really understand. And although we keep on saying that I empathize, I understand, oh, you've been going through this, it's not real. And this is what the people uh, who have been writing about this say, that no, we don't need this. You don't understand. But give us the space for us to articulate. That's what we're saying. It's pretty difficult. Um, actually, uh, you've been talking about, uh, you've brought together the medical humanities, illness, and uh, disability within the same this thing, and which uh, gave rise to this uh, line of thought. I was just wondering, like, uh, there are certain diseases that we find, uh, certain medical conditions that we find uh, very much predominant in, in societies, like diabetes being one, which also restricts uh, a particular kind of lifestyle. And in that way, we, it is also a disabling uh, kind of a, uh, condition. But uh, when we are talking about uh, disability studies, or, or when we are looking at uh, Professor Sati yesterday, uh, you, you talked about the term stigma attached to. So because uh, certain kind of disabilities, they are more evident. I mean, they are more visible. Like if uh, someone uh, is visually impaired or someone is mobi mobility impaired, that is more visible. So maybe the stigma is more with the visual uh, 
representation or, or visual manifestation of the disability as compared to what we now call illness or other thing, which again is a form of disability. So would you like to kind of comment on that? You're right in, the, in that um, the so-called normal human response to a visible disability is one of uh, distancing. Uh, I think that is a part of the stigmatization process. Even unwillingly, the normal person, healthy person would dissociate or try to stay away from the disabled person. Because I think, I think it is not that the person would not try to understand. The thing is that basically human beings, and this is a point made by disability studies, uh, critiques that human beings, when you look at uh, a disabled person, are basically selfish. So the thing is that the moment I attach myself to a person who is not fully able, then it, the responsibility will be mine. That is a factor that uh, plays a part. The other thing is that I would not like to be seen being part of that society, the society of the marginal. It could be anyone. It could be uh, disabled in the body or um, in terms of behavior, in terms of uh, unexpected responses. So um, if, even if it comes to something like diabetes and if someone is having a party and there is a person who is diabetic, then that person is likely to be sidelined. Okay, that person plays, uh, will find that person in the corner and I'll be having a party. So this is something that I think uh, has acquired normativity through, uh, I think, uh, uh, the way we respond and behave. Uh, I don't think there's a way out. And what we, what we, we, we human beings are forgetful uh, in, the, in the sense that tomorrow, of course, I'll also fall ill, I'll also find myself on the other side. But so long as I'm here, I think things are fine. And that, I think that is how we operate. It's very unfortunate though. Uh, we had a very enriching, engaging experience. Uh, thank you, sir, once again. Uh, before we disperse for the tea break, uh, as already announced, let's just uh, get together for the photo session. Thank you all. Who will be presenting a paper on critiquing the disability of Bonda women? And next, we have Nabanita Sen Gupta from the Sarsuna College, Kolkata, who will present a paper on advertising and disability, changing face of Indian films. And then we have Sanjukta Naska from Janki Devi Memorial College, Delhi University, who will be presenting a paper on tales of disability, a relook re at popular folk and fairy tales. And then we have J.D. Lalmangai Joba from Government Saiha College, who will be presenting a paper on representations of disability, the genre of horror fiction. Then we have Nancy Lalimpui from Government Samphai College, Samphai, who will be presenting a paper on It is Okay to Not to Be Okay, reading S.C. Mangales, This is Not a Love Sin, and Loti Mills, the Chenjeling, and uh, the sixth is a student from our department, Ms. Rodingpui, uh, research scholar in our department who will be presenting a paper on disability ability. So all the paper presenters, I would like to request you to come over here with me so that at the time of discussion we don't exchange the microphone also. We have uh, six paper presenters, three on my left, another three can come on my right. Roding, please come. So uh, to begin with, I would like to request Professor Sarangadar Baral for his presentation. With respect to our chair and uh, two uh, uh, speakers, I will begin my um, brief, inter, uh, brief uh, discourse uh, that is titled as um, 
critiquing the disability of Bonda women. I think most of us uh, may not be very familiar with uh, this uh, tribe called Bandaj. Bandaj are located uh, located in the southern uh, western part of Odisha. They are uh, a special tribe by their own right. I will here refer to some idea of disability that is um, attributed to uh, specifically to the Bonda women. Uh, it is uh, this uh, um, idea of uh, visiting the women with their uh, physical appearance and with their system of clothing themselves. So that has become uh, a topic of uh, uh, disabling uh, the women would there. I will refer to two folk laws, folk tales that govern their style or you can say practice of uh, wearing or unwearing clothes. One folklore tells that some Bonda women one day happened to see Sita Ma, that is the celebrated uh, image of uh, uh, Sita uh, of the Ramayana. They saw Sita Ma bathing in a stream and they giggled because they saw her naked at that point. And being offended, Sita Ma cursed them to live naked without wearing clothes, their heads seven or else. Not a blade of grass will grow in their land. Their race will be wiped out. On their appeals, Sita Ma tore a lean piece of cloth off her sari and offered them to cover their lawyer private part. So this is really sad. And another, uh, uh, another uh, folk tale uh, similarly narrates that, um, uh, <coughs> that uh, Mahapru Rama, that is Lord Rama, Mahapru, Mahaprabhu, or God, Lord Rama. Mahapru Rama, introduced snake responsible for bringing death in the Bonda Hills. Amazingly, the Mahapru split a uh, hair, a strand of a hair from Sita Thakrani. Thakrani means goddess, Sita Thakrani. And she was called on to give that strand of a hair life, and she did. The hair turned into a huge snake which moved out and bit a Bonda baby to death. So that way, death was introduced into the Bonda land. So these two incidents are undoubtedly sad and of a horrendous consequence to the Bonda culture, to their memory, and to their way of uh, life. But strange as it sounds, the events have not produced nostalgia for the past with the women for their clothes or uh, the remos. They call themselves as a remo. Their language is also called remo, R-E-M-O, remo. So a human being like Bonda is called remo in their language. So the remos did not, uh, you know, have the uh, a nostalgia for that immortal deathless time because already uh, death is introduced uh, to this land. On the contrary, the bondage bore with strength and fortitude the misfortunes and forgot their sad lore in dancing and living life on the hills home. So um, whatever the story in appearance to our ideological radicals, ethnographers, the Banda did not strategize to question or spawn Sita. Here, the wrongdoer. The way what we 
traditionally believe that uh, Surpanakha and Ravan did to Ram and Sita. The story of Adibhumi, the Adibhumi is, uh, I should uh, uh, give you this idea, Adibhumi is the ethnographic narrative written by uh, written by one important Odia uh, fiction writer. She is Pratibha Rai. Uh, she was also conferred with the Ganpit Award, that is the highest national award for literature. Ganpit Award for some other, uh, some other narrative, not for this. But she spent several years with the Bonda people and tried to study them and write, of course fictionally, about their practices, customs, belief systems, and all that. And this uh, Adi Bhumi is translated uh, uh, into English as the primal land. In perhaps after uh, its uh, publication, uh, the publication was done recently, so to say, uh, 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 two decades ago, 2001, the first publication about this Adi Bhumi, the primal land. So there we find that uh, Sita Ma was a perfect stranger to this community and so on. But, uh, uh, but uh, as we feel that uh, the Banda women were cursed not to wear, not to wear clothes, Okay, so that is uh, one of the disabilities that they suffered. Uh, but I have tried to uh, take a cue from uh, uh, Derrida's, uh, uh, Derrida's uh, uh, critical uh, insight about the structure, the structure even of a society and so on. So I had tried to see that from within the structure of that Banda society, we can find certain critical response to this idea of disability. And uh, as uh, uh, Derrida has uh, said that uh, uh, you can find from within the metaphysics, it's, uh, uh, you know, the germ of its difference or the critical idea of its opposition from within the structure itself. No need to go out of the structure to invent some other things to conflict uh, or to bring into conflict with the uh, structure. Uh, sir, so, just one second. Uh, uh, within one or two minutes, sir. Within one minute? One or two so, minutes. Uh, so then, uh, <coughs> okay, thank you. So then, we, uh, I have also uh, tried to see whether within the Banda uh, society itself, uh, 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 this uh, idea of uh, power relations can also be relevant to see that the Banda men and the Banda women uh, were actually fighting for some space. But the Banda world is full of uh, disabilities and ironies. The Banduni grown old would quietly receive another woman, her competitor, and the fresh young choice for her healthy man, man now grown stronger. She now old may freely move out and go back to her parents' village without much regret or nostalgia. To her, this is the world of um, this is the way of the world. Therefore, the folklore worldview may not fully explain some of the disabilities and fantasies or tragedies and ironies in the Banda life. The external world waits to see the Banda uh, move dynamically and cope up with a modern world. But to my mind, the Banda world howls to the external world, change your gauge. Don't come with your gauge, that uh, educative gauge, learned gauge to read us. Leave us to our own land. So that is where I'll say, uh, if there are questions, I can uh, 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 really be happy to uh, answer that when question comes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, of course, it's not possible to make a, a very good presentation within a very short period of time. We hope that uh, things that uh, has, not, uh, have, has not been said here can be discussed later in the round of discussion 
after the presentation of all the papers. I would like to request all paper presenters to stick to within 10 or 11 minutes. And then up, after the presentation of all, we will have a round of discussion. Whatever that has not been said can come up uh, during the time of discussion also. So now I would like to request uh, Nabanita Sen Gupta from uh, Sarsuna College, Kolkata. The topic is Advertising and Disability, Changing Face of Indian Ad Films. Good morning, everyone. And uh, with my regards to all the eminent uh, presenters, uh, resource persons, and students here, my paper attempts to bring together the idea of advertisement and feminist disability studies through an exploration of female disabled body in the ad spaces, particularly in the ad films. In exploring the representation of disability in media, I chose advertisements because they are markers of popular cultural representations. They are also markers of a consumerist society and in the globalized and post-globalized market economy play a very crucial role. In fact, they are one of the key players in the smooth running of the market economy by creating a need for a product, by stimulating a kind of desire or creating a, a kind of narrative around the uh, efficiency of the product and the indispensability of that product in our lives. Often the need that is created is an artificial one with a lot of problematic social markers that perpetuate stereotypes. One very good example would be all these fairness cream ads that we uh, found uh, running in the market quite uh, like uh, heavily. Now in such an economy driven society, it would be a point of significance to see how the ads negotiate mar marginal identities and why. While, ad while advertisements have generally focused on the normative uh, ideas upheld by a per particular kind of body type as ideal, and not just as an ideal, but also something that is aspirational, like all, all everyone who's, who are viewing this advertisement should aspire for that particular kind of body type. What is it that uh, there is this current um, engagement with a doubly marginalized identity, that is the female body with the disability? Now, that's for the purpose of this exploration, I have picked up a few ads. Uh, all of these ad advertisements are available in the YouTube. Uh, there's one that is Joy Luca's uh, jewelry ad, which was referred to, by uh, referred to by Dr. Saba yesterday, where we have this bride who's a Kajol, Kajol fan, and she writes a letter to Kajol uh, in my, uh, uh, expressing her desire to meet her, and then Kajol comes. The scenario is of a big fat Indian wedding, and uh, until the ad is almost towards the end, we don't realize that the girl is actually on a wheelchair. What we see is a decked up bride with all her friends dancing around, the kind of uh, normal Indian wedding that you see. McDonald's Eat, Equ Eat Qual ad. This ad has multiple versions. Uh, two feature uh, a girl with one arm and the other features a boy. The focus is on sameness, how everyone is equal and how a small thing, that's how it's written, um, is, uh, and that small thing is actually McDonald's equal burger can prove the sameness. Then we have the other ad, Degree, which, is, which they give the tagline as world's first adaptive deodorant built with a diverse disability community. They say that this is because of the design of the bottle, because the bottle has a hook, so uh, even a person with uh, one arm can uh, put the bottle uh, on some kind of a latch and just pull the bottle down and use the deodorant, while other kind of bottles would require both your hands to pull that out. And uh, there are, uh, there, the other one is a uh, KFC ad, uh, which uh, talks about, there, there are a series of ad on International Sign Language Day, where for on, on that particular day, KFC observes a sign language uh, day and no one is allowed to speak. The customers have to use sign language to um, order. So, and they have a prize for one person who can uh, communicate non-verbally. And, but there is one KFC ad, which is called Shamata, which also means power, uh, which is a five minute long ad about a woman's empowerment through KFC. There's this uh, girl who is, uh, who, there's a mute girl, she cannot speak, and the mother is always scared that something would happen to her. So she kind of uh, keeps her, uh, always uh, uh, keeps on accompanying her and keeps her protect in a very protected kind of an environment. The girl completely hates it. Till the point she rebels, she takes out this uh, bicycle and goes around the town. And there she finds this KFC outlet where she lo locates uh, that uh, these uh, person behind the counter, they are using sign languages. She comes back home, uses her laptop to apply. 
and she gets a job. So it's a kind of a, a narrative which shows that uh, this girl is being empowered through KFC. Then, then there's this Apple ad, which is called the greatest Apple ad. Uh, that, is, that is how it is uh, mentioned in the ad, which brings different categories of disabled people together and show how these um, gadgets are enabling to these different communities of uh, different kinds of uh, disabilities. Now, each of these act, uh, advertisements, they focus on a different aspect of disability representation. But one thing that becomes very common in each of these is the way they are represented, particularly the way the camera acts. The female body or the face is focused more uh, than on any other thing. Like uh, even in the KFC ad, the boy behind the counter has a mask and a cap, but uh, the focus is on the uh, girl at the counter and her full face is shown and the female body is uh, kind of uh, made visualized. And also, uh, the disability of the individual is highlighted. What Dr. Sati yesterday referred to as the pornographic gaze in disability, we find that coming again and again, particularly in the McDonald's Eat Call ad, where the uh, uh, focus of the camera for the most of the time is on the arm that the girl does not have. Now, in all these advertisements, we find that there's a feel-good factor at work. None of these ads jolt us out of any kind of uh, consciousness of the viewers. They do not trouble us. They do not trouble our conscience. They do not even uh, sensitize us to the different kind of needs that different uh, people or different individuals may have. They are all very pleasing visuals. And uh, uh, in, in many ways, they per perpetuate the dominant narratives. If we look at the settings of this ad, most of these cases, they are upper class, upwardly mobile uh, ad. The Joy Lokas ad, as I said, it has this uh, girl uh, con like draped uh, and laden with jewelries, uh, a very uh, that uh, fat Indian wedding setting. Uh, that, that, and this ad, I feel that it uh, up upholds the uh, heteronormativity in multiple ways, the wedding being one of the uh, uh, ways in which the, it celebrates the girl's inclusion in the normative uh, way of uh, life. KFC and McDonald ads are all placed in the middle and upper middle class uh, because uh, it's only from these uh, families that you can find girls and boys, young girls and boys, uh, school uh, children mostly, uh, celebrating with McDonald's burger, and uh, that definitely talks about an affu affluent community. The girl without arms in all these ads is seen that she is adapting to the ways of lives of her friends. There is one ad where uh, she is uh, being an equal pa participant in a birthday party celebration. So she is using her arm and uh, her elbow, one arm and the other elbow, to use the uh, uh, to uh, stick the happy birthday banner, and then she is using her one arm to uh, open the bags. So we find that the setting is a completely uh, setting of an ableist society. What we uh, today term as a normative society and she is uh, using all her uh, capacities to uh, fit herself into that. The narrative shows that she does not require any help but then while there is an attempt uh, at uh, beginning a discourse around disability uh, by making the girl... Two more minutes. Right, thank you. By making the girl at the center of the story, these ads are also imposing a similar social expectation upon them that they are supposed to behave in a particular manner. Now, why should these, uh, uh, it, why should anyone be forced to expect it to cater to the idea of normativity that is dominant in the society? The, similarly, the Apple ad, which shows a very large community of person with disability, but then there is an exclusivity in the representation because if we look at gadgets, gadgets are enabling for all of us. So so while you are making uh, an and particularly with a, a set of disability, uh, differently abled people or people with various ki uh, kinds of disability, are you not excluding or othering the, uh, uh, them from the, from the normative discourse? Now, um, Ellen Houston, in uh, one of her study of representation of female body with disability in the advertisements in US, she says that in order to create progressive representation of disabled women, advertisements must focus on uh, subverting ableist stereotypes and embracing the naturalness of bodily diversity rather than reinforcing traditional and oppressive discourses. 
In conclusion, I would like to say that though some discourses around uh, disability is being generated by these ads, they are also chiefly following a kind of tokenism. This is a de demonstrative, there's a lack of actual idea of inclusivity. They're always in chic, beautiful, ideal kind of a setting, and in many ways, these ads impose the idea of normative expectation upon, upon people uh, from uh, various uh, kinds of uh, disabilities. This brings us also to what Professor Bivash uh, Chaudhary talked about in, towards the end of his talk, that there's no need for empathy, but a place for the articulation. And uh, with these uh, kind of corporatized, uh, glamorized ads, we find that that uh, different space for articulation is reduced in fact completely negated and what we have is just uh, uh, just a kind of a celebration of normativity by making some token representation of people with disabilities in their advertisements thank you thank you navnita uh, now sanjukta naska from janki devi memorial college delhi university the topic is tales of disability a real look at popular folk and fairy tales. Thank you so much. Uh, very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, the title of my paper is Tales of Disability, a real look at popular folk and fairy tales. Um, they are divided into three parts. I'll try and see if I can finish. Uh, introduction. A society is rendered more sensitive with a conscious awareness when its young members begin to show a vast amount of emotional concern for minority issues namely disabilities existing among their social counterparts. Disability in children's literature can be defined as, and I quote, attitudes and practices that lead to unequal and unjust portrayals of people with disabilities in children's literature, close quote. Attempts have been made by authors to counter literary stereotypes of class, racial ethnicity, caste, gender, from children's literature to provide a more egalitarian representation of social relationships. Stereotyp stereotyping of any kind, whether gender roles, caste, or class bias, consolidates a very negative notion and limits the actual psychological growth of the young and impressionable minds. Notwithstanding the clear attempts at an unbiased characterization, disabled characters and disability concerns are so deeply entrenched in the adult mind that oftentimes the representation of disabled characters involuntarily emerge from an appropriated social structure. Douglas Bicklin and Robert Bogdan, in their article Handicapism in 1977, identifies seven, 10 common disability stereotypes in children's literature. Uh, a, person with a disability portrayed as pitiable and pathetic. B, person with a disability as the object of violence. C, person with disability as sinister or evil. C, person with a disability with our peripheral to the main action remaining within the backdrop of the narrative. E, person with disability as an antagonist. F, person with disability as laughable. G, person with disability showing a lot of self-pity. H, person with disability as a burden. I, person with disability as asexual. J, person with disability as fully incapable of participating in everyday life. These, comp these comprehensive parameters diagnose an overall approach to the way in which characters are depicted in literature for children. Using clearly defined, almost flat characters, the narrative too follows a linear path delineating between good and evil. The ghettoization between what, who, is good or evil leaves very little space for negotiating between these stereotypes. With a practically easy and exciting storyline, the narratives do not challenge the way, uh, in the way of thinking among the young readers or listeners. Wilhelm Grimm, in the preface to Children's Household, Children's and Household Tales, states, and I quote, the tales live on in such a way that no one thinks about whether they are good or bad, poetic or vulgar. We know them and we love them just because we happen to have heard them in a certain way and we like them without reflecting why, close quote. The vitality and perpetuity of the tale still persists engaging and entertaining, entertaining all alike. Interestingly, Grimm's children's and household tales have been part of the Prussian and German teaching curriculum for over 30 years. Folk and fairy tales have been the source of children's childhood and perhaps an initiation into the real world. Yet an example of this real world is surprisingly unreal, reflecting upon a particularly fantastic realm. Severely patriarchal gender roles with child abuse, incest, cannibalism, infanticide have a crucial presence in folk fairy tales. 
within a wide range of the subject matter is a wider range of characters who are identified through their disposition or temperament or their physical appearance. Grimm scholar Jack Zipes contends that, and I quote, the tales through depictions of families that face starvation, children abandoned, and consequential exploitation of the desperate and the different may very well reflect the lived experience and the social attitudes of the families in the 18th and 19th century, close quote. The severity of the suffering resonates with a deep-rooted sense of deprivation and marginalization of those who narrate and remember. Of the 211 characters in Grimm stories, almost 67 would have, in contemporary definition, been described as an individual with a disability. Some of the prominent or commonly ascribed deformities are vision impairment, emotional disorder, learning disabilities, and so on. Physical de 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 deformities like gigantism, dwarfism, albinism, bodies with warts, hunchbacks are frequently found in fairy tales. Isolation or abandonment in disability stories. Um, physical and psychological disability proliferates throughout folk tales and fairy tales, creating a sense of discomfort in countering actual persons with such disabilities. However, if, if one is to delve deeper into the nuances of such tales, the fissures of discriminati discriminatory narration becomes even more disturbing. In a story like Hansel and Gretel, which is extremely popular and quite well favored among the populace, has its moment, which though not discoursed upon, carries within itself a passive narration of faulty relationships. The story, can be, uh, as can be seen, remains passive towards the cruel parents who unsympathetically abandon their children. The focus and the image that one carries till the end of the story is that of the witch's meaningless pursuit of entrapping children in order to later make a meal out of Hansel. Historically, witches have remained a figure of controversy, being the subject of public and social ostracization. Iona and Peter Opie mentioned this concern in a children's opera of the story of Hansel and Gretel, first produced in Munich in 1893. The opera, in fact, omits the most painful part of the traditional story, the parents' deliberate abandonment of their children to the wild beasts of the forest. The disability in the case of the witch is her body deformity, and she's also half blind, along with her cannibalistic tendency, which makes her a social outcast, who, according to the story, has created a trap of candy house to lure children. She certainly does not fit into society and has to undergo a prolonged wait for lost and abandoned children to lose their way in the forest and to fall prey to her hunger. The story naturally carries a deeper meaning about the possible dangers lurking within the folds of society that can cause harm to unsuspecting children. However, to add disability as a conjoint to this figure of malice, social outcast and th threat for children creates perceptions which undoubtedly color and maim the minds of children. The idea of the deformed outcast runs as a common parallel in fairy tales, generating a deep-rooted suspicion and equating physical deformity with mental depravity. The telling of fairy tales to children and the telling, of t e uh, telling even of tales of horror is possible and mind-stretching and even in a curious way reassuring. If the tales are told in the right circumstances, that is if children and adults are already united by the bond of confidence or affection, if the child sees the teller of tales as a co-adventurer with him in listening to the exploits, and if the child appreciates that the story is fantasy, or that the action is distant in time or distant in place. It is sad to report, as Jella Lepman has done in Abridges of Children's Books in 1969, that the, when the great exhibition of children's books was staged in Munich, immediately after the Hitlerian War, an exhibition that was intended to be, and was, an opening of doors to the new generation in Germany, it found that the story of Hansel and Gretel was not always regarded as pre preposterous, that the fantasy was too close, close to reality, and for some, the witch's oven too much resembled the gas chamber at, at Auschwitz. In a situation like this, when impressions as such can be deeply ingrained in the mind, a closeted sense of discomfort begins to develop in the juvenile minds. Representation of evil or wicked sister, stepmother. Social structures of wicked stepmothers are reinforced in the Little Snow White and Hansel and Gretel stories. Zipes, in his translation edition of Grimm's fairy tale, states the controversial figure of a stepmother as an access acceptable forum for evil. For instance, in the 1912 and 15 edition of Little Snow White and Hansel and Gretel, the wicked stepmother is a actually a biological mother, and these characters were changed to become stepmothers in 1819, clearly because the Grimm's held motherhood sacred. 
evil stepmothers and sisters work like marble for fairy tales, being the point of concentration for all evil. Such images carry an extremely gendered perception. Cinderella, Cinderella, Hansel and Gretel, Snow White, all have the presence of father figures, and yet they are quite unobstructionist and continue to function as mute spectators in the narrative of the story. They are non-communicative, insipid, shadowy figures who mutely accept their virulent counterparts. They are also oftentimes the biological fathers. Society revels in demonizing women for all atrocities in familial constructs, giving way to, a consolidated, uh, to consolidate a monstrous figure of the woman. The demonized woman is oftentimes a witch or a stepmother or a stepsister. Calumny becomes the easiest way to look at women as the source of all pain in the lives of the protagonist. Snow White, a woman herself, finds her greatest enemy in the stepmother, so does Hansel and Gretel and Cinderella. The fairy tale world is a world of fearful adventures, untold suffering, and yet it is not providence. Rather, the one who is closest to the hero or the heroine who demands long and arduous trials for them. Ma'am, two more minutes. Right. The figure of the witch attracts a lot of attra attraction for children, creating images of stereotypes of long noses and pointed hats with cannibalistic behavior. The tales never give a substantial set of reasons for evil, yet appropriates it within the fold of the tales with the hope for a naturalized perception of evil emerging from women figures. Disability, as I see, it is reinvented through the multiple perceptions that have standardized themselves within a social structure that provides a deeply fractured representation of society. Easy to consume folk and fairy tales become initial tutors for children in constructing deep-rooted images within the infantile mind. In my paper, I have attempted to look at popular folk and fairy tales in order to analyze the way in which storytelling methods can play a vital role in making an impact on the pliant minds. Caution needs to be maintained as children are introduced to the colorfully impressionable images of flying horses, untold adventures, exotic and fantastic characters, along with day-to-day -day events, and easily relatable characters. Multiple stories speak of disabled characters and disability as a common feature. Disability becomes an identifying feature, circulating both as a punishment and as an identifiable marker for inadequacies. However, it is important to remember that disability and disabled is not an unchanging constant. And it is upon us as members of a society to create an atmosphere of acceptance and genuine concern. Disability is also equated with criminal activity, mental incompetence, sexual license, which disabled individuals of society are still struggling to overcome. These abstract categories continue to plague our society and have converted into identity markers which have a real impact on people's lives. Folk and fairy tales have an endearing charm and are our first tutors to look and understand social life and open juvenile minds to the vagaries of life. Therefore, we need to maintain caution or perhaps rework tales. Tales are and have always been dynamic so that multiplicity is encouraged, appropriated, and assimilated. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjuk Tanaskar. Now, uh, J.D. Lalmangai Jopa, Government Saiha College. The topic of the paper is Representations of Disability, the Genre of Horror Fiction. Thank you, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, the topic of my presentation is Representations of Disability, the Genre of Horror Fiction. Uh, the title of my paper, the focus is rather white. Uh, I don't know how much of uh, justice can I do in 10 minutes, but I'll try my level best. I'll just quickly read through the paper instead of uh, elaborating it so that I can somehow finish in 10 minutes. This paper attempts to examine issues surrounding representations of disability in the genre of horror fiction. Though the paper primarily explores the relationship between disability and horror fiction as a genre, it briefly analyzes the novel Dumaki, a horror fiction by Stephen King, and the movie Split, uh, a thriller horror film written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan, to put into perspective the arguments built in the paper. Mitchell and Snyder, in their concept of narrative prosthesis, postulated that literary narratives and films often depend on disability as a device of characterization. They consider disability as a crutch upon which literary narratives lean for their representational power, disruptive potentiality, and analytic insight. James Catchpole, a disabled writer, expresses a similar view 
and said, disability is a literary device. And it's such an effective literary device because disability provokes the strongest of emotions. Literary narratives about disability are not just largely non-disabled centric. It also deals heavily, it also leans heavily towards stereotypes and expectations about disability by the dominant non-disabled consumers of literary narratives. Disability and horror. Horror comes under the genre of horror fiction. As opposed to literary fiction, which is considered to be broadly defined by realistic characters, real life settings, complex themes, use of literary devices and experimental writing techniques, genre fiction follows certain tropes, structures, and archetypes. Horror fiction is a genre that is intended to disturb, frighten, or scare. However, the central menace of horror fiction is usually interpreted as a metaphor for larger fears of a society. The problem that horror has posed for disability studies is mainly the problem of effect. It is not just simply that horror is widely understood as a genre that invokes a fearful response. The issue is that disability is often used as a device to achieve horror and how this effect correlates with interpersonal personal disability encounters. In horror fiction, people with non-normative body minds are often presented and framed in a manner that evokes fear and revulsion. However, horror fiction has been largely avoided by disability studies for critical inquiry due to the perception of the genre as escapist, socially disengaged, and sensational. Critical inquiry of horror texts are often heavily influenced by the tendency to interpret it in terms of race, gender, or class, repressed elements of society, or of individual psyche, due to the genre's excessively, problematically corporeal forms. Hence, critical analysis of horror texts from the perspective of disability studies is often lacking. Horror's excessive corporeality invites understanding it in terms of something else, and it's usually in the form of a metaphor. Dumaki by Stephen King, a horror fiction published in 2008, deals with several disabled characters. The protagonist, Edgar Fremantle, loses his right arm in a construction site accident and suffers serious head injuries, which impair his speech, vision, and memory. Due to the effect of his brain injury, he has bouts of uncontrollable rage and anger. Apart from being a tragic figure of loss, Edgar is depicted as violently out of control. He falls within the trope which Snyder and Michel calls the disabled avenger of horror, whose disability causes them to seek revenge on others. Later, Edgar is framed and depicted as another familiar figure, the lucky cripple determined to overcome as best as he can the restrictions imposed on his condition. Overcoming narratives is a familiar and favored narrative mode for representation of disability, often dealing with the figure of the supercrip or disabled hero. A supercrip is a disabled figure whose extraordinary abilities of power operate in direct relationship with disability. In the novel, Edgar's extraordinary talent for painting is consistently linked to his injury, and he discovers his talent and desire to paint only after his accident. Thus, in its depiction of Edgar and the novel, the novel presents a, high, a series of highly conventional disability <clears throat> narratives that are reductive and stereotypical. On the contrary, according to Ria Shane, Duma Ki actually conveys that he is none of them, or at least that none of them are the sum of him. The very invocation of these reductive images of disability calls into question their accuracy and representation of disability experience, highlighting their inability to encompass the complexities of disabled lives. As far back as 1949, uh, Wimsett and Birdsley had warned readers of effective fallacy. But unlike literary fiction, the genre of horror, as already mentioned, relies heavily on effect. And the relationship of effect with regard to representation of disability is a complex one. 
Split is a 2016 psychological thriller horror film written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan. The film follows a man with dissociative identity disorder, DID, who kidnaps and imprisons three teenage girls in an isolated underground facility. According to Dominic Evans, a disabled writer, Split joins a long list of films that demonize people with mental health disabilities. Some of the tropes that this film employ include the idea that violence is an acceptable symptom of disability and the idea of having subhuman power and strength for no reason other than being disabled. One of the protagonist's personalities, the beast is hyped as a superhuman grotesque persona. Disability is used as nothing more than a plot device and the source of horror in the film lies in the protagonist uh, Kevin's disability. In conclusion, due to the centrality of effect in the genre of horror fiction, its potential to influence perceptions of disability is immense. Reflexive representations of disability may help shift attitudes, feelings, and perceptions about disability, but texts work on readers' feelings about disability in a complex and cumulative ways, and how individual readers will respond to specific representations is often unpredictable. Hence, though the combination of effective and reflexive engagements with horror genre has the potential to improve attitudes and feelings about disability, it can also be problematic. This is evident in the above analysis of Duma Key and the movie Split, wherein readers or critics take on the effect is not homogeneous. The question of whether horror fiction merely exploit and reinforce stereotypes regarding disability, or whether disability-informed approach could offer new and transformative insights into the workings of horror fiction has no easy answer in terms of binary, as effects like meanings are not simply locked up within text, but produced at the juncture of text, context, and reader. Though reflexive representations of disability can definitely help shift feelings, attitudes, and perceptions about disability, the honors does not lie solely on the authors of horror fiction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, JT Lalmangai Soba. Uh, next is Nancy Lalimpui from Gamin Samphai College. And uh, the topic is, it is okay to not be okay. Reading S.C. Magales, this is not a love scene and Lottie Mills, the Chenjeling. Thank you, sir. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as sir has mentioned, the the title of my paper is It is Okay to Not Be Okay, beginning with an introduction. Uh, it cannot be denied that disabled people are highly underrepresented in literature, and the narratives that include disabled characters often give an invalidating portrayal of disability that reinforce negative stereotypes. Depiction of characters with disability often follow, follow stereotypical tropes such as, uh, I quote, pathetic victim, avenging villain, courageous protagonist, freaks or harmless innocent characters, close, close quote. We see examples in well-known literary works such as the hunchback King Richard, King Richard III of Shakespeare, Victor Hugo's Quasimono, the saccharine tiny Tim of the Christmas Carol, the one-legged mad Captain Ahab in Moby Dick, or the vindictive Captain Hook in Peter Pan. Narrative tropes also usually include either a super creep storyline that involves an inspiring disabled person who, achieve, who achieves exceptional accomplishment in spite of the adversities they face, or myths of a cure, which follows the storyline of a disabled character who dies at the end or is cured of disability by the end of the narrative. Conventional narratives have mostly shown disability as something to be cured, eliminated, I quote, fixed or overcome and depict life with a disability as tragic, pitiable, and burdensome, close quote. This dominant view results in disabled people as well as non-disabled people perceiving disability as inferior and undesirable. 
The aim of this paper is to critically analyze representation of this ability experience as depicted in This is not a love scene by S.C. Megale and The Changeling by Lotte Mills, both of which belong to the genre of young adult literature in both works written by disabled authors. Uh, the, uh, the methodology of the paper. The paper approaches disability as both a biological factor as well as a social construct. The World Health Organization uh, definition of disability 2022 understands that the condition of the body or mind can be debilitating, but at the same time, environments, social expectations, public policies, non and non-disabled attitudes can also be disabling factors. In fact, they can at times be even more disabling than the actual disability. Now discussion and analysis of our uh, two stories. Written by disabled authors, the changeling and this is not a love scene address deficit views of disability. The stories, while displaying the societal biases and limited perspective towards disability, also largely focus on the positive attitude of the protagonists towards their disabilities. Now, uh, a focus on this is not a love scene. Published in 2019, S.C. Megales, This Is Not a Love Scene, tells the story about the realities and fantasies of being a teenager living with a disability. The novel, while explicitly addressing society's deficit views of disabled bodies, maintains a positive view towards this ability. It dispels the belief that disability must be cured or eliminated for the person to be viewed normal. For example, it is established that Maeve's illness has no treatment and cure was not even on the table. And affirming that her disability is not the only focus of her teenage life, Maeve and her doctor discusses her ability to have a typical teenage experience, such as exploring her physical sexualities with her new romantic interest. Maeve does not like that she is considered less than in the society because of her disability. She calls out the pervasive exclusion and stigmatization, as well as the sentimental objectification of disabled bodies. Uh, for example, while visiting an office, Maeve attempts to reach a clipboard from the secretariat counter and finds that she is unable to reach the board. When she asks help from the secretary, the lady is full of apologies. This uh, expression of excessive pity towards Maeve makes her feel rather insulted rather than making her feel good. In another instance, Maeve going to the movies finds as usual that two able-bodied people are sitting in the only two seats that are wheelchair accessible in the theater. She comments that such instances happen a lot because non-disabled people never expect disabled people to have fun like going out to the movies. Rejecting negative tropes of disability, the story shows that Maeve always takes pride in what she is capable of. She calls it abuse of the disabled when a non-disabled person steps out of their way, thinking that she needs help even when she is just sitting somewhere doing nothing. She is okay with her disability and does not wish to be non-disabled. She, however, believes that she will be able to do more for herself if her physical and social environments were more accommodating to wheelchair. Now coming to The Changeling. The Changeling by Lottie Mills has won the BBC Young Writers Award 2020, and it tells a story about a girl who is born with a physical disfigurement that look like wings. While fairy tale inspired, the story is situated in a modern day environment with coming of age framework. The very opening of the story presses the notion of how disability is devalued in society. It begins with a comment. There were no flowers when Rowan was born. It was nothing personal, I don't think, suggesting that Rowan's birth is not celebrated by the world. The mother points out the attitude of the society towards disability, which is to look to look at it with fear, open quote, a deep paralytic fear which nobody could never quite explain, close quote. And because disability is seen as something that needs to be cured and because life with disability is seen as tragic and pitiable, the medical experts are quick in their attempt to fix Rowan's deformity. And even before she feels her mother's touch, the baby is already familiar with the rubber gloves of the doctors. While the medical term is trying to fix her abnormality, the mother catches sight of the baby's gaze and feels as if the baby is judging them of wrongdoing. She also admits that 
Rowan's disability is not her primary concern, only an afterthought. The story, strongly dismissing the myth of cure, mentions that Rowan's protruding bones cannot be operated on because they are not made of, open quote, the rubbery, tumorous flesh they anticipated, but pure sinew in bone, rock solid and permanent, and as Rowan herself, unapologetic for their existence. The story also depicts Rowan's changing attitude towards her disability. As a child, she is perfectly fine with her wing-like deformity. Uh, people's fascination with her wings increases and they start to call her a real-life fairy. Their fascination then turns into curiosity and swarms of reporters constantly follow her at home, school and park. And the little girl never talks about how she feels about the public obsession with her. But on her 12th birthday, she takes a kitchen knife and tries to cut off the lumps on her back. Her difference from others in her pre-adolescent years has turned into a source of agony. Then in her teenage years, Rowan begins to develop a sort of resolve. Though her body crumbles under the weight of the wings, though she can barely walk and her skin bruised at the touch, her mind remains determinedly fixed on some invisible horizon, and her eyes fill with, open quote, an aching nostalgia, close quote. Without giving a reason, she tells her mother that she could not stay, and on her 18th birthday, her mother finds her room empty. It seems she has flown out the window of her room. Literally and figuratively, Rowan has left her nest to be out in the world to be on her own. The short story ends with a remark that Rowan is unchanged, and, open quote, flying at last like she was meant to, with wings white and resplendent, and her sepia eyes twinkling with laughter. And though, uh, close quote, and though there were no flowers the day the disabled girl was born, she is now always draped head to toe in flowers. Now coming to the conclusion of our paper. This ability is a unique condition in the sense that people can enter and live the experience of being disabled at any point in life. Sharodov explains that devaluing disability and privileging ability is so pervasive that ableism becomes a permissible prejudice which allows ableism to operate, open quote, below our cultural radar and remain socially acceptable. Ableism not only appear in the form of negative prejudices, but it can also manifest in the form of positive ableism, such as pity, paternalistic protection, and unprovoked praise for disabled people. Even highly celebrated young adult literatures featuring disabled main characters such as TV Padma's A Time to Dance and Francis S. Stork's Marcelo in the Real World, while authentically representing disabled experience, do reinforce the idea of disability as a condition to overcome or cure. The changeling, and this is not a love scene, on the other hand, dispels stereotypical tropes and ableist analogies. Rowan does not need to be fixed to be adorned with beautiful flowers, and Maeve remains unapologetically ordinary and proud. The stories show that it is perfectly okay to not be okay, and that this ability is not the singular defining factor of a person, and that it is only one among a diverse and ex extensive identity marker. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, next is Roding Pui from the Department of English, uh, who will be presenting on the topic abil disability ability. Mm. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My topic is uh, Disability Ability, a rereading of the Mizo folk tale, Tsurbura or Tsura. For this paper, I will be dealing with the social and cultural reception of disability in the Mizo context, focusing primarily on the intellectual disability and its intersection with the folklore through a reading of a Mizo folk legend, Tsura or Tsurbura. I will look at the discourse, the cultural discourse surrounding this folk tale, Tsurbura and uh, how the, I will talk about the concept of passing in disability and how this uh, concept, this concept of passing uh, interacts with the human narrative. So when I say Tura or Turbura to the Mizo mind or to the Mizo years, it has a comical ring to it, it has, it has a comical effect. So it invokes uh, laughter in inherently. So, but for, the, for some of our guests, this might be the first time you've heard of the word or the folk tales, Turbura. So as we go along, I will try to uh, insert some instances from the story. A brief look at the Mizo literary landscape 
True disability lens will confirm the issue of underrepresentation. Even within the historical narrative, disability is hardly discussed. Douglas C. Binton has uh, rightly observed that disability is everywhere, but at, if, we looking, if we start looking for it, but conspicuously absent in the histories we write. So uh, with the paucity of this information, Proverbs as a folk literature serves as the earliest narrative that informs us of the cultural and social narrative, uh, cultural reception towards uh, disability. So we have uh, a proverb in Mizo with disability reference, and the most common one is which refers to or which translates to disability may befall anyone late in life. So this saying, this proverbial saying, carries the salient voice of culture that realizes the human corporeal frame as temporary able body. So to give a brief introduction about Sura, so it would be more accurate to say he is a folk legend because uh, it is speculated that he actually lives and he is not only a character of the, in the folk tale. Uh, it is believed that he was still alive in the 14th century and he reportedly lived in the eastern part of Mizoram and monuments are still erected and they are still preserved. And many idioms and phrases are rooted in the story of Tsura. And our Mizo historian and folklorist D.S. Dashok has firmly has firmly believed the facticity of his existence and um, there's a common saying and there's a claim in Mizo that uh, Mar, the Mar people are descendants of Tsura. And from this claim arises the saying that Mar people are slow witted because of their alliance to Tsurbura. And this phrase should present an overture to the discussion surrounding Tsura's character and his carnal association with an intellect that borders on the abnormal, on the irrational, and the comical. So Turbura has been commonly described as the, within quotation, silliest of all the simpletons and the cleverest of all the wise men. So this dichotomous observation reflects the paradoxical nature implicated in the opposing binaries of Tsura's disability and ability. The folktale has dominated the Mizo oral and written literature as a narrative of humor, wit, and foolery. It has been canonized as a trickster tale and noodle head tale or the numbskull tale where and in this in such tales the hero is usually the archetypal fool or the wise fool so the numbskull is explicitly defined as a person with a profound intellectual disability who always represents the normal the non-normal world and always takes advice literally so to substantiate this uh, in one instance of uh, in the folk tale we uh, one time, Tura's wife asked Tura to uh, cook his breakfast, to cook breakfast on when the sunlight hits the top of the Hmong tree. So Tura took this literally and he uh, started climbing the tree and uh, carrying all the cooking fire utensils and all the food. So he was planning to cook on top of the Hmong tree. And in another instance, Tura was previously told that the ears of a dead person is always cold. They are always cold. So one time he touched his ears and they were cold. His ears were cold. So he thought that he had died and he went to the morgue by himself. So, and as a trickster tale, the action of Tura, within quotation, are at the margin of social morality and normal behavior. And Carl Jung has defined trickster as a summation of all the inferior traits of character in individuals and this inferiority transpired in Tsura on the intellectual level. And the most curious case of Tsura's adventure was his travel to Mongping village where the people did not excrete at all because they do not have the batok. And when they saw Tsura answering the call of nature one time, they were very curious and they were very surprised so they inquired and Tsura very, for some reason told them that when he was a child uh, when he was a baby, his mother uh, made an incision in his batok. So that is why he was able to answer to the call of nature. So, and the village mothers uh, wanted their children to undergo this same procedure. So they brought their children to Tsura and Tsura performed the procedure. And he locked all the children up in one place for three days. And on the third day, the mothers found that their children had all died. And there are a series of uh, very interesting, very funny uh, stories dealing with how he tricked the people of Mongping village uh, who were trying to uh, capture him as an act of vengeance. And 
But at the end, we have to know that he emerged as the most successful member of the community in the end because of his clever tricks. When looking at Sura, it is impossible to look at only his cleverness or his foolishness, hence his archetypal role as a wise fool. So this very important archetypal role, the wise fool, is a folkloric motive, which is a literary paradox. He is a character of great brilliance who is void of common sense. He reflects a shift. This character, this archetypal character, reflects a shift from the two-dimensional portrayal as um, previous presenters have uh, continuously mentioned, portrayals uh, of disabled individuals as evil, as inhuman, or cloyingly pitiful, two characters that are fully functional. So the archetype, the wasteful archetype, adds a dynamic in folk, in folk narrative, blurring the lines between the binary oppositions, sane and insane, normal and abnormal, wise and foolish, and this has instigated the oldest narrative of Tsura as a simpleton and as a clever trickster. So humor as a method of passing. Uh, Brun and Wilson, in their book Disability and Passing, introduced the concept of passing into the disability studies. Passing of disability connotes the act or behavior of disguising marks or symptoms of disability or deviancy. For, for example, yesterday Professor Sameshwar Sati said that the train conductor did not uh, figure his blindness initially. So if he had went along and if he had uh, played along and uh, disguised his blindness uh, by some means, he would have passed as an able person. And in but passing also occurs on the abstract level, which we see on the nar narrative level in Tsurbura. So in cultural discourse surrounding Tsura, there's a certain degree of passing, meaning that there is a deliberate disregard or censoring of the elements of disability. And this, uh, this passing could occur because the social reception of Tsura and our understanding of Tsura has been circumscribed within the humor and comical narrative. So when we talk about the character of Tsura, we focus on his innocence and his naivety, not his deficiency or unethical nature, because innocence and naivety are the first requirements for the process of fool making. At this juncture, I would like to bring in the concept of the Mizo word, bol, which could be equivalent to the word fool making, and also it loosely tran uh, translates to the uh, exploitative act of manipulating someone so they will make a fool of themselves so uh, for our own amusement and ent entertainment. So we say, me can bol, mean bol soup or something. And it is also synonymous with uh, bullying but divergent in the sense that it has a comical aspect to it. So it cannot be definitively, definitively considered as an offensive act. So this concept is the most normalized, culturally accepted and non-disabling form of social response to intellectual disability. So the cultural reception of the folktale Tsura reflects the social and cultural response towards people with disability, intellectual disability. John Morrill has affirmed that there is something odd, no, abnormal or out of place which we enjoy in some way. And Etlap has also said that within quotation, every group must have a fool. Thus, the normative narrative that transmits or that tells the story of Tsura through generations has cautiously performed the process of disability construction based on the mm. dominant society's self-serving need for a character like Tsura. Mm. A person Roding, that exists please. Roding, please. two more minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. A person that exists on the margin. So Tsura exists on the margin, and from that margin, he could switch between the normal world and the abnormal world. And from the uh, plane of reason to the absence of reason. So in order to, all this switching between two worlds is in order to humor those people, the normal people who are confined by normalcy and reason. And the cultural reception of Tura is predominantly as humor narrative. This standpoint has offered position to explore how cultural discourse has allowed passing of Tura's disability. This cultural passing of disability occurs only when the symptoms of disability stays within the acceptable realm or at the margin. Through the character of Tsura, we see an individual that transgresses the cultural and ethical restriction without actually upsetting the social order, largely because the assumed innocence and mindlessness of Tsura has shielded him and secured him as spot at the societal margin. In the folktale Tsura, 
for conclusion, the intersection of disability and folklore procures a subversive picture of disability by inducing laughter instead of fear, amusement instead of pity, and passing instead of disgust. The cultural narrative has unconsciously rejects disability as the locus of the legend of Tsura because his intellectual disability offers the normal people and the normal society the opportunity to perform the universal task of full making. A reading of Tsura also reveals the vast spectrum of human intellect and the diversity of disability spectrum and the difficulty of confining disability within barriers. So Tsura, we can say, is a character that has become a site of deconstruction of the normal and abnormal binary. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rodimpui, and all paper presenters. Uh, we started it a little late. I do not know how much time may be given for discussion. If the convener can just tell, can I take another 20 minutes or so for discussion? So we, we are late by around 30 minutes. So, uh, so we have just witnessed the uh, wonderful presentations, six papers uh, before us. The old papers are now open for discussions. If anyone wants to make some kind of an observation or if some questions are there uh, to, uh, for, for seeking some clari clarification, you are most welcome, uh, especially our students who are looking for the research avenues in the days to come in future. Uh, this is an interesting area from the Bonda tribe to ad films to folk tales uh, in the disability studies. Uh, so this is open for discussion. Most welcome. Uh, uh, who is our student who arranged the microphone? Is it dear? Uh, okay, okay. Hello? Hello? Okay, uh, I have a question for Nancy, ma'am. Um, uh, in the novel, This Is Not a Love Scene, and the short story, The Changeling, um, I noticed that uh, the story uh, highlights both the harmful effects of negative and positive ableism. And so I wanted to ask you, um, um, how do you suggest uh, we navigate these complexities um, to promote a more inclusive and empowering environment and society uh, for individuals with disabilities? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's, as I uh, mentioned, uh, this quotation by Shorodo, it's so easy and it uh, first, uh, it operates below our cultural radar that it remains socially acceptable. We, I, I believe that we all feel pity for uh, when we see disabled people. It's, it's innate to us because we have been uh, molded in, in, in that thought. So I believe uh, the way we can improve is to locate and uh, recognize literature and even when we do this ableist, uh, what can be termed, labeled as uh, an ableist trope and just be mindful that uh, not only this um, how to say uh, a feeling of uh, that, that uh, as Sarzatia's paper not just the negative trope but even uh, positively we can make them feel less than we can make them feel small even when we don't need them we just feel pity for them I think we can recognize such instances in literature as well as in culture and then be mindful of that and become aware of that thank you okay I have one question for uh, Sarzet Dilan Mangaizawa and uh, I, I myself, I am a big fan of horror fiction and we all think that uh, the important thing is 
to be critical uh, of the representations of disability in the horror fiction, uh, in the horror movies. And my question is that, uh, do you think or uh, how do these uh, representations of disability in this horror fiction uh, has an impact uh, the way that people with uh, disabilities are viewed or treated in the society? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think uh, not just in my paper, this entire uh, seminar has addressed about uh, negative stereotypes and uh, negative representation of people uh, with disability. Uh, I think that there is no one easy solution or answer to this. My suggestion would be that uh, if we can uh, promote uh, a stronger interrelationship between uh, disability studies and literary studies, which we are doing right now, I think that would be one important step. Uh, but with regard to the impact, I think it is immense, and horror fiction in particular uh, is replete with negative stereotypes regarding disability. And my paper has briefly tried to address how this genre has been uh, conveniently neglected by uh, critics in the field of uh, literary studies because the genre is considered to be uh, non-serious. It's considered to be something based on effect uh, as opposed to the so-called serious literature which is supposed to deal with uh, you know, serious issues, intellectual issues that concern society. Due to the non-serious nature of horror fiction, I think uh, critical inquiry uh, is uh, remarkably less, and it needs to improve immensely. Uh, I don't know if I answer your question. Thank you. Okay. I have a question for Ms. Nabanita. Uh, okay, so you mentioned uh, the advertising and uh, disability, the changing face of Indian ad films. So, uh, we are living in the postmodern world where everyone is trying to be inclusive, right? So, um, uh, you have mentioned certain ads that include uh, disabled persons. And uh, as for me, I, th uh, I was thinking that uh, the advertisers are uh, advertising and uh, using this disabled person in a... They are trying to be very positive. That's what I was thinking, but as your paper, uh, according to your paper, I think you, uh, you were implying that the um, inclusivity is insulting. So my question is that how can uh, this inclusivity uh, be portrayed without insulting the disabled person? Uh, well, uh, I won't use the word insulting. Thank you uh, for bringing this up. What I meant is it's more oriented towards the ob ableist understanding of the society. Like, uh, as we heard in both the keynote uh, of yesterday and today, that there's, there's this entire dialogue of creating a space which, which would be an inclusive space. So the ad firms, what they are doing is they are continuously perpetuating the dominant narrative, not taking that effort which would be required. Uh, one small example would be that, uh, that deodorant uh, uh, degree, uh, deodorant ad, where they focus, there are four ads. In one of the ads, they focus on the bottle structure, saying that it can be used by uh, people with uh, various kinds of uh, disabilities because you don't need two hands to open it. But it's a, it's a very minor uh, thing, but then I found that this is only ad which talks of a space. But then again, there's a problem with the representation in the ad stories, because uh, the two ad stories that is there for degree, one uh, presents a, a super creep who is into boxing, the male, uh, the ad with the male protagonist, figures uh, one who's, uh, a man with, without hands and uh, like two of the arms are not there and uh, he is into boxing and the rink is the area where he is trying to prove himself which is kind of the representation of a super crib and the other is a woman without uh, who is visually impaired and uh, she is in the skating rink 
Now, when you're looking at the man in that advertisement, the figure, uh, the focus is on the ma machoism, which is again a very ablest uh, construction of the male figure. And when you are looking at the woman in that ad, uh, she's on the skating ring, and for a brief moment also, there is this focus on the, uh, like, uh, the female body as a site of sexuality because this uh, she is in the uh, she's about to take a bath with a towel wrapped around her, and the camera focuses on that. So once again, we are focusing on a very dominant heteronormative uh, uh, representation of the body, not giving them an inclusive space. We do not know, uh, we do not ever get to see a space in which uh, other narratives are in, uh, like uh, brought in. But one of the reasons could be that these ad films are made uh, from an ableist perspective. These are not uh, uh, made from the perspective of a but person with any kind of disability. So it's not, I'm not saying that it's insulting, I'm saying that the effort is not enough. The effort is perpetuating the kind of conversation that uh, is already existing. Could I? Uh... Hello? I have a question for Sarbaral. Um, how is the attire of the Bunda women and the idea of disability connected? Hello. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, if we have the familiar, uh, you know, gauge that we have perceived to be our standard, the canon of our normal or normativity, that does not apply to that land where the where the Bunda people live. They uh, uh, they consider uh, our world as the alien world, and we will n we are not supposed to interfere even with our ideas of a progress, ideas of growth, ideas of education ideas of enabling them, they will not accept this. And this Banda tribe, uh, one study says that this tribe was one of the first migrants from their African origins. 60,000 years ago, they settled down in that uh, hilly terrains, which is perhaps uh, 5,000, uh, uh, you know, feet um, in height up from the sea level, okay? So they do not consider us to interfere in any way in their practices, in their faith system, in anything. That doesn't mean that they are completely inimical to us, but they don't believe in your education, in your great, great scientific ideas, in your, uh, you know, progress, they don't believe. They want to, uh, you know, stay like as they like, and they will, uh, whatever, if changes come, they will take at their own pace. They will not accept ours. So that is why they have invented a way looking at their course to uh, cover their, uh, the breast portion and the lower part of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the private part, the private part, with the long slings of beads, garland of beads. You can see from the internet, from your mobile also. And they cover their head with those, uh, you know, slings of beads. And uh, uh, you can naturally ask how they uh, do with that, because they are, uh, uh, you know, habituated with that, and there, my question is, how these uh, uh, remo males could accept these women, uh, you know, covering their body with their, uh, you know, uh, they call uh, uh, lubaya. Lubaya means uh, the uh, uh, the beads. Okay. So, uh, but these uh, men did not uh, come forward to persuade their women to wear the normal clothes which are actually accepted by the, uh, the other world. The other world means the educated world as we consider ourselves. 
Okay, so they did not interfere and the women accepted the course to be very, very important to protect and preserve their culture, and especially their men. Because you, you will not be surprised to see that Banda women will marry uh, a male who is 10 to 15 years junior to the Banda lady. And the Banda lady will actually uh, actually groom the man to prove his manness. So she is not merely uh, the friendly figure, the companion, but a mother figure. The mother, in the role of the mother, the mother will breed and feed and take care of the young male to come to that uh, strong man. So that is why when the woman becomes old, the Banda man who is now grown old, uh, grown rather stronger in age, he will need a little stronger woman and reject the old woman. Divorce the old woman, she will automatically go to her parents without any complaint. Can you imagine of that society? All our, uh, you know, uh, uh, wonderful ideas of progress of education doesn't work there. Doesn't work there. Till this time, hardly, you know, 2000, uh, 2001, that book came in. Not many things are written about them. And the, uh, the government officials go with their life, uh, you know, uh, uh, life taken at their throat. At any time, one can face the, the moment of death. You, uh, you try to learn their gauge. Your gauge will not work there. Because the Banda male is always, uh, uh, you know, respected as a, a very, very hot temperament. Very hot temperament. And interestingly, I'm, it's not part of the question, but interestingly, I'm giving you the idea that how such a tribe can survive there in that, uh, you know, alienated world. This Banda man is so you know, uh, known for his hot temperament that out of a little conflict, without uh, considering uh, your hospitality, your humility, your education, he can, without any thought, kill you at the moment. And very wonderful thing about that is he will next moment run to the downhills, that means below the hills. Okay, so he will go and s surrender himself to the jail authorities for life imprisonment. That is the honesty, the kind of honesty that he has. And he will learn his way in the imprisoned life. And another interesting fact is, when his jail term is over, he will be waited by the Banda community for the last moment that he will be received as a knowledgeable man among his community. He will be respected by his community because he has experienced another world. So this is the wonderful thing about them and still the government uh, you know, protects this Bonda uh, life and culture without intervening much. Okay, thank you. Uh, there, there may be questions, but uh, I'm running short of time. I know all of us are hungry. By this time, we are running short of time. So let me just conclude. I don't have anything to give any uh, expert comment on all these uh, papers from Bonda Tribe to add films to folk tales into the disability studies. So uh, let me just conclude this. Uh, where, where is the lunch? I think. Can you just outside? Yeah. Uh.
Thank you, Dhanajit, for moderating this session, session so well. Uh, we have lunch uh, being served outside. Just uh, before lunch, uh, the faculty of our department and our two re uh, resource persons will just have a group photograph out here. The rest of us can move out. And uh, let's try and get back here by 2 o'clock. All right. Thank you, everyone. are presenting in this session. This is session five. I'm Margaret L. Patsol from the department. Uh, even as we're waiting for the others to come in from the lunch break, uh, let's remind ourselves that we are a little uh, short of time also. I will welcome uh, the four paper presenters here to come and share this space with me. Uh, PC Lalrin Mwani from Government Kamlanagar College. Rin Mwani, please come here. Then Mal Soma. Mizoram University, Zirsang Liana, again from Mizoram University, and Moses Lalnun Fela. Please. Come. As we are aware, this is the last uh, technical session of uh, the seminar. This will be followed by a valedictory session. This is session five. Initially, uh, we were to begin at 1.45. Now it's 2.10, a little extended. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we're hoping that each one of us will have uh, 15 minutes of presentation time, followed by question-answer session. I will first invite uh, PC Lalrin Mwani from Government Kam Kamlanagar College to present her paper. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone present here. The title of my presentation is Representations of Disability in Select Works of Yukio Mishima and Osamu Dazai. Yukio Mishima and Osamu Dazai are two of the most prominent writers in modern Japanese literature. And they're, like their literary creations, they both lived very unusual lives. They were both from affluent upper class Japanese families and they both died from suicide. Mishima at the age of 45 and Dazai at the age of 39. This paper examines two texts, namely The Temple of the Golden Pavilion by Yukio Mishima and No Longer Human by Osamu Dazai to explore the complex and unusual representations of disability and the disabled self. Now, uh, I will go into a little bit of history regarding uh, the perception of disability in Japan since we are dealing with Japanese uh, writers. The Japanese term for disability is shogai. Uh, physical and mental disabilities have long been a taboo subject in Japan. Disabled individuals are often hidden and banished from society by their families because there exists a deep-rooted uh, culture of stigma and shame surrounding disability. Uh, mental disabilities are even more taboo because they can be hidden. Now, this is quite ironic when we consider the fact that uh, Japan has one of the highest rates of depression and suicide in the world. Up until 2014, mental health issues have been carefully guarded as a personal and family secret. In the 1960s, Japan, some corporations even provided in-house psychiatric consultations under conditions of strict privacy to protect the mentally ill. This tradition of secrecy around mental illness persisted partly to avoid stigma. Uh, mental illness is often viewed as the inability to exercise willpower, which further signifies weakness, laziness, or personality flaw. And that is why people feel a sense of shame if they lack this willpower. Uh, there is an incident in 2016 when a Japanese man went on a, a stabbing rampage at a, a, disabled, uh, sorry, a disabled care facility, uh, killing 19 disabled patients and wounding 26 more uh, to quote unquote, rid the Japan society of disabled people. And the identities of these victims remain undisclosed to the public till today because uh, the victims' families request the authorities uh, to do so. So this unfortunate and horrific incident shows the, the persistent continuity of the culture of shame and stigma surrounding disability, especially mental disability in the Japanese society. Uh, in the novel, The Temple of Golden Pavilion by Yukio Mishima, uh, 
the novel follows the story of a young, stuttering uh, Zen acolyte named Mizoguchi, uh, who is driven mad by his obsession of the beauty of the Golden Temple, uh, which makes um, him decide to burn the temple and die inside it. Uh, and the, the other novel, No Longer Human by Osamu Desai, is an autobiographical novel by uh, sorry, that narrates the story of the depressed protagonist called Yozo, whose alienation and incapability of understanding human beings uh, leads him to the shady life of crime, alcohol, drug, prostitutes, and eventually leading to multiple suicide attempts and his confinement to a psychiatric ward. The commonality shared by the selected narratives is that they mostly feature as their protagonists alienated individuals who fail to subscribe to normative behaviors of the society and who are deemed useless, aimless, or even disabled. The psychological aspect of mental illness and the suing, ensuing isolation and the disabling conditions they experience are explored and uh, tackled with. Their, through their action or inaction, these social outcasts have the ability to disrupt the stability and the foundations of reality for the people around them. Now, this ability can be understood as any physical, cognitive, sensory, or psychiatric impairment where the functional limitations and restricted ability impedes individuals to take responsibility for their daily functions and hinders their full and effective participation in society on equal basis with others. And this often leads to social isolation and discrimination. The notion of the normative standard is projected as the perfect and therefore essential and fully human in a position to disability which is casted as a diminished state of being human. Uh, in the context of Japan, uh, people with mental disorders or mental illness, uh, such as schizophrenia, phrenia, bipolar disorder, or de de uh, depression, and so on, are considered to be disabled if their illness hinders their everyday life and make it impossible to uh, live a normal life. And there is a certificate, the medical disability certificate that is even issued to them. And here in, this, uh, in the novel, The Temple of the Golden Pavilion, Mizoguchi's severe stuttering uh, locks him in his own world, isolates and bars him from the outside world. Uh, being unable to communicate effectively with his peers hinders him from having meaningful con uh, interactions with others, thereby severing him from the social space. Uh, the fact that his stuttering is an, uh, an, a drawback to him is evidenced uh, by uh, his own statement, my, uh, I quote, my stuttering placed an obstacle between me and the outside world. It is the first sound that I have trouble uttering. The first sound is like a key to the door that separates my inner world from the outside world. And I have never known that key to turn smoothly in its lock." End quote. Uh, Mizoguchi's mental uh, deterioration is spearheaded by his obsession with the beauty of the temple, which eclipses his uh, sanity and hinders his functionality. He sees his deformity, which uh, arises from his stuttering and his perceived ugliness of himself as a contradiction with the great beauty of the temple, which gradually drives him mad. Since he cannot attain beauty, he comes to resent what the temple symbolizes and feels compelled to destroy the temple and die in the process. His erratic behaviors and the gradual instability of his mental condition by the time he finally sets the temple on fire make it difficult to identify how much of what is going on in his life is actually happening as in factual or uh, imaginative. Uh, in No Longer Human, Yozo's story from childhood to adulthood suggests that he is someone uh, who struggles with me uh, mental health, the constant state of depression, alienation, dissociation, and depersonalization depersonaliz he experiences throughout the novel hinders his ability to live like a quote unquote, a, a proper human being. His mental state impedes his ability to be functional in his daily life and hinders his participation in the society. As stated by him, he is forever branded on the forehead with the word madman, lunatic, a reject, and hence he is disqualified to be a human being. Disability represents marginal position in society, a state that is considered othered relative to our expectations of what the able-bodied 
or what healthy, productive members of the society should be. The anthropologist Robert Murphy revealed in his book, The Body Silent, that one of the most upsetting results of his uh, acquired disability was the uncomfortable reaction and social discomfort his disability prompted on the able-bodied others. The lives of Yozo and Mizuguchi depict this process of othering and the stigma and shame that surrounds this othering. Uh, Yozo is labeled as a good-for-nothing reject, a criminal, a lunatic, and a madman, and he is even disowned by his father. Uh, regarding uh, his way of living, a bar owner even commented that uh, when human beings get there uh, that way, they are not good for anything. Uh, and um, the other protagonist, Mizoguchi, has been mocked and looked down upon for his severe stuttering throughout his life, which results in his self-isolation from the society that has shown him so much hostility. Uh, the people in their lives fail to show sympathy for them and ostracize them for their apparent inability to live like the uh, abled others in the society. Uh, there's another character in the Temple of Golden Pavilion called Kashiwagi. Uh, he is a friend of Mizoguchi, and uh, he happens to be born club-footed, which affects his walk and movements. He uses this deformity to seduce women by making them feel sorry for him. Uh, and at one point, uh, he discloses his sexual experience to his friend. Uh, he was trying to uh, um, have sexual relations with this attractive girl, but he became repulsed by his own club feet touching the girl. And similarly, when Mizoguchi touches the young woman he goes on a date with, images of the golden temple comes to his mind and he is reminded of his ugliness and his deformity and his sexual desire is crushed immediately. So these incidents clearly show not just the, uh, the shame and stigma, but the internalized ableism uh, that makes the disabled person constantly participate in the process of disability disavowal and uh, their aspiration towards the norm. Since early times in Japan, disability was categorized based on the severity and the perceived level of impairment, which related disability directly to the individual's capacity for labor. The category of disability experienced had an impact on the way society viewed the individual and his or her ability to participate in the public sphere and gain social status. In the settings of the two novels that I have uh, used for this presentation, uh, the settings are in the 1930s and the 1940s uh, Japan respectively that is before and during the Second World War. Uh, so during this time, patriotism, ultranationalism, war prep propagandas, and loyalty to the country and the emperor were proliferated among the masses. Uh, Yozo and Mizoguchi's turbulent lives and their uselessness in the society are certainly in opposition to this collective nationalist, ableist mentality prominent in the, their countrymen. Uh, to conclude, Mizoguchi and Yozo expose the aimlessness and the sensibilities of useless men that contradicts the demands of collective non-disabled society where each individual is expected to contribute to the collective well-being. They expose the interaction between functional limitations of the abnormal or disabled characters and the social barriers of the disabling environments that hinder their full participation. It is crucial to see beyond an individual's disability or dysfunctionality and consider his or her humanity or the interior part of his life. This is clearly stated by the character Muzo, uh, Mizoguchi in his statement, uh, I quote, why does there seem to be something inhuman about refusing to make any distinction between the inside of the bodies and the outside? If only human beings could reverse their spirits and their bodies, uh, could gracefully turn them inside out like rose petals, end quote. By decentering ableness and centralizing the voices of these self-indulging uh, disabled anti-heroes, the, uh, the novels make it possible to look at the world from the inside out, that is, from the perspective and lived experiences of those who are constructed as the marginalized and largely invisible others in the Japanese society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irvin Wani, for your paper. Uh, as followed earlier, we will have the time of interaction after all the papers are done. I shall now invite Mal Soma to present his paper 
the paper is entitled The Enhancement of the Disabled in Transhuman Media. Mal Soma is a PhD scholar at the Department of English and Culture Studies at Mizoram University. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so yes, the title of my presentation today will be The Enhancement of the Disabled in Transhuman Media. Uh, <clears throat> so before going into my primary text themselves, I will uh, have a short explanation of what the term transhuman uh, implies. Uh, so in the modern era, the image of the human being that has been established since antiquity has begun experiencing unprecedented changes with the rapid advancement of technology. The term post-human has thus been conceived to identify the idea of this new form of man that is being conceived. And the term transhumanist refers to advocates of this change as opposed to those who are partial to a slower, more conservative pace who are called critical post-humanist. But in the transhuman view of progress, the adoption of machines and computers that will provide aid to disabled individuals so that they can perform on the same capacity as normally abled human beings is evidence of mankind's eventual movement towards a post-human future. Uh, I will be examining the depiction of disabled individuals in the novel New Romancer, written by William Gibson in 1984, and the video game Deus Ex Human Revolution, developed by Eidos Montreal. So both sources are seminal works within the field of science fiction, and they are considered benchmarks for the depiction of transhumanism in popular culture. The worlds that are depicted in these two settings are set in the not so distant future where the human body is subjected to many radical changes in the forms of implants and augmentations. These enhancements of the body will be put under scrutiny, whether these truly are the so-called improvements and whether they eradicate the concept of a disabled person or whether they only contribute further to the ostracization of individuals without the capability of acquiring these enhancements. So according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, a person is termed disabled. They have a disability if this person has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. For example, people with bipolar disorder, diabetes, or addiction to alcohol, they are all considered disabled if we go by this definition of the word. Uh, so that will be holding true for the disabled individuals we will see in this text. Uh, so moving on to the first text, Neuromancer. So written by William Gibson, it follows the story of a criminal hacker in the distant future named Henry Dorset Case. In this futuristic dystopian world of the novel, there exists skilled individuals such as the protagonists who are able to access a virtual reality called the Matrix, which is akin to the real world internet. Uh, so this novel was written much before the conception of the internet. <clears throat> uh, so that there is no uh, accusation of plagiarism in this case. So this Matrix, as depicted in the novel, is used for storing valuable data for large corporations, which uh, the protagonists and other hackers make a living stealing from. And each real world location has a corresponding location in the matrix as well. Now the disability comes in the novel in the form of the protagonist's case. Uh, in one of his uh, stealing jobs, his hacker jobs, the protagonist is Scott, he's caught trying to steal, and what happens to him is he becomes punished by being surgically burned uh, in his nervous system with a toxin, and that toxin disables him from entering the matrix ever again. So he has been cut off from his main method of uh, income. So he has become, um, uh, how do you say, without income, without a source of living. 
So having built his entire adult life out of his skill and with this suddenly being taken away from him, the protagonist becomes disabled and he befalls into a deep depression and in order to find a way to cure himself, he moves to Chiba City in Japan, which is considered the cultural center of all things uh, related to cybernetics and augmentation. But he is still unable to find a way to regain his lost ability to enter the matrix. And so what does he do? He turns to drugs and he becomes engaged in self-destructive behavior also that he can try to find the satisfaction that he could once feel while he was able to enter the matrix. <clears throat> For him, who had once experienced the bliss of the matrix, being confined to the physical world was like being stuck in the prison of his own flesh. And although this disability is not something that can be considered a disability for every human being in the world, it is a life-altering event that prevents Case from achieving tasks that he could have normally performed before, and thus it is categorized as a disability for him. Eventually, as the story continues, the protagonist is uh, healed of his injuries when he accepts an offer from a rich individual who wants to make use of his abilities. Despite not trusting this mysterious man, Case has become so emotionally fragile and vulnerable from his disability that he accepts the offer. So he is able to enter the matrix finally after surgeries are performed on him that include the replacement of his spinal fluid and organ transplants. He desires the safe space that only the matrix can provide. So even uh, after his abilities have been restored to him, he still feels disabled in a way because the real life reality itself is a form of pain, is a form of uh, uh, danger for him because he desires the safe space that can only be provided by the virtual world. So the protagonist is not the only person in the novel who is afflicted with this uh, idea, with this ideology that the real world holds nothing but pain. As there are other human characters like uh, Molly Millions, Peter Rivera and Armitage and countless others in the world who have turned to augmentation. They desire stronger bodies, but even after they have been enhanced, they still feel the need to go even further, and they only feel satisfied when they enter their virtual world. So as long as they remain in reality, they are vulnerable, they are disabled in a sense. <clears throat> so it is not just the disabled in the in the sense that we know, who seek augmentations, but rather the entire population as a whole. Uh, now moving on to my second uh, source, Deus Ex. It is uh, similar in setting to the world seen in New Romancer, set in the future, where it is filled to the brim with amazing feats of technology, but where lawlessness runs rampant. And similar to Henry from New Romancer, the protagonist in Deus Ex also becomes afflicted from crippling injuries. He works as head of security at a tech company when it is uh, subjected to a terrorist, terrorist attack. After being injured in this terrorist attack, the protagonist Genshin has to become augmented as 50% of his body has become redundant in the terrorist attack. So, even though he has become stronger, he has become more capable than before. Jensen is deeply resentful of the state of his body, and the first thing he does is try to tear off the newly augmented limbs that he has been uh, fitted with, as he does not want to be uh, augmented in such a way. It was not a consensual augmentation. In the setting of Deus Ex, augmented human beings have to take regular doses of a drug in order to keep their bodies from rejecting their new implants. So, despite the theoretically superior capabilities offered by this augmentation, the augmented people still have to rely on a drug in order to maintain their new bodies. Thus, augmented people fall into two groups, 
the wealthy who have a steady access to this drug and the less fortunate who have to resort to desperate means to acquire this drug or else they would be subjected to the consequences of being unable to adapt to their new augmentations. Uh, the existence of the augmented and the non-augmented individuals introduces a new dynamic to the societal hierarchy. The chokehold that corporations hold over the production of this drug means that the augmented are not truly liberated from their disabilities. They are still uh, in control of those who control their drugs. Then the term disabled has to take on a new meaning because disabled does not refer to the same context that we know in the current real life. The existence of augmentation, which affords greater capabilities to individuals in possession of them, calls for a newly constructed view of exactly which individuals should be labeled as disabled. <clears throat> so in regarding to this prosthetic, as in the modern day, prosthetics already exist. People who have lost their limbs or organs or whatever, they are already being subjected to uh, prosthetic treatment. So with regard to this subject, Natasha Vita Moore, a prominent transhumanist writer, has stated that prosthetics are no longer merely a replacement of a missing part of the body with an artificial one. Instead, they have already altered the realm of normal. So there is a new state of the normal. It is no longer um, what we say to be normal is no longer the normal that we have come to know as we grew up in the past. And according to another transhumanist writer, David Jack Fletcher, uh, open quote, Notation, uh, notions of disability are largely based on presupposed ideological frameworks of what constitutes the human. Furthermore, the whole human, particularly regarding perceived understandings of normalcy, the existence of these prosthetics, both in real life in the modern age, as well as in the transhumanist depictions, or ways to enhance the disabled, is not a complete solution or a means to eradicate the disabled. As can be seen from the state of the augmented, the true protagonist in the text that I have chosen, despite finding ways to overcome certain disabilities on paper, in practice, additional obstacles continue to arise and there needs to be a new definition of what is normal and what is disabled as well. So transhumanism, instead attempts to forge a new concept of what it means to be human, to be not normal, and a state of being which would ideally be more easily attainable by a greater number of humankind. Instead of those, uh, those disabled having to seek out help that is very difficult to acquire, that requires money, that requires years of treatment and therapy, the transhumanists instead, they advocate a new uh, source or definition of what is normal and what is disabled, as can be seen in the true text that I have uh, selected for this study. Uh, so that will be all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malsalma. We will call upon the next presenter, Zir Sang Liana. His paper is uh, From Theory to Praxis, Crypt Theory and Queer Narratology in Crypt Theory, Cultural Science of Queerness and Disability by Robert McRoor. Uh, Zir Sang Liana is a PhD scholar from Department of English and Culture Studies, MZU. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. So a few months back, when my supervisor, Professor Burrell, um, posted the flyer for this uh, conference, when I look at the topic, unfortunately, it was a topic that, was, uh, that I was very unfamiliar with. After a few, a few days after that, I started reading some sources. And during the course of my reading, I came to the realization that um, despite the many records, written records and academic records kept about disability studies, there was still a wanting, a longing for a practical approach, practical method. And so the primary focus of my research paper is to investigate the possibility of a pragmatic engagement 
with the identity politics of queer, uh, queer people and disabled people. And that is a daunting task for many reasons. And one of the main reason is that when we talk about identity politics on any level of any type, in academia it is an established understanding that identity politics operate on a continuum. I would like to take the example of the characterization of queer characters in a novel titled Giovanni's Room by um, Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. The first character is David, who is the main protagonist. And David is a bisexual man with a manly appeal, a manly aptitude, I would say. But deep down inside, he harbors an internal homophobia against effeminate gay men. Then we have the character of Giovanni, who is a beautiful, beautiful Italian bartender who has the appeal, physical appeal of a woman. Then we have Jacques, who is a successful American businessman and who is revered socially because of his wealth, despite his sexuality. Then we have the fourth character, which is the flaming princess, who is a full grown man dressed in a woman, clothed in a woman's clothing with full blonde makeup all over his face, or otherwise what we would call drag in this modern day. So we have these four characters who are represented in this novel, yet they are so different, different in their appearance, in their mannerisms, that means that any form of assumption or generalization in characterization would entail that some sections of the same community that we are trying to represent will be excluded. And also when it comes to narratology, it is very important to keep in mind and keep in account the historical context of marginalized peoples marginalized people, and in our case, disabled and queer people. It is crucial to acknowledge the historical significance of monumental events such as Stonewall Riot 1969, the removal of homosexuality from their official list of mental illnesses by the American Psychiatric Association in 1973, the Matthew Shefford and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Pre Prevention Act 2009 since. They represent a long history of battles fought and won by these communities to get to where they are now in this day and age. And George Chauncey, who is a historian, has done an, an extensive research on the urban gay culture of New York City from 1890 to 1916, that is a span of 70 years. And he came up with this observation that during those eras, during those decades, sexual intercourse between two men was not an uncommon practice. It was a common practice, but for a lack of better academic terms, in a male-on-male -male sex sexual intercourse, I think we can all understand that there is the giver and the receiver, right? So men back then, as long as they are not the receiver, they do not lose their status as a man. And they were not branded as homosexuals or gay men. And we should also keep in mind that the term gay was used to refer to homosexuals only in the 1960s, which is quite recent. Before that, gay, gay, the word gay simply means happy. And the irony of this entire situation is that nowadays we are constantly saying that we are living a liberal world. We have become more liberal day by day, that we are progressive as a civilization. But the distinction between these two this binary distinction, I would say, between homosexuality and heterosexual has become more pronounced in comparison to the days back then. Because the distinction between, two, between heterosexual and homosexuality was very 
very narrow back in the days. So quickly skimping over to the 21st century, Robert McGrewer came up with this theory that combines both disability and queer theory called the Crip theory, which comes from the word cripple. But we should know that cripple is not a term that is diminutive and should not be used lightly. In his theory, <coughs> he introduces the theory of compulsory, compulsory able-bodiedness and compulsory, compulsory heterosexuality. This system produces disability and is woven together with the system of uh, compulsory heterosexuality that produces queerness. Crip theory is concerned with the ways in which neoliberal capital capitalism, the dominant economic and cultural system as driven by market priorities, has imagined and composed sexual and embodied identities. And a good example of this is the prolification of, um, a proliferation of BL movies and series these days. I'm sure many of the younger generation are familiar with this. BL simply stands for boys love or boy love. Am I right? So what happens here is that in the popular media, in popular culture, BL series and BL themes are very, very common. And they have garnered attention from many people, especially from the younger generation, and, and I personally know many friends who are uh, deeply involved, who are deeply, you know, uh, who are great friends of this type of movies. What happens here is that McGrewer said, the new system that we are under, it does not discriminate be the difference, between the difference and more it does not, uh, you know. But on the other hand, it, it celebrates the difference to the point that it makes profit out of it. So for popular TV medias, instead of making a movie about heterosexual relationship, since they know that most of their viewers are younger audience who are interested in BL, you know, the type of relationship, it is much more convenient and more profitable for them to make a movie about it. Boys love or whatever it is called in this modern day. And crip theory and where does queer, queer narratology comes in? Crip theory and queer narratology share commonality, commonalities in their goals and approaches. Both fields critique normative culture narratives that marginalize and exclude marginalized identities. They emphasize the importance of challenging negative stereotypes and harmful representations and promote the visibility and empowerment of disabled and queer individuals. In conclusion, crip theory and queer narratology offer valuable insights into the representation and construction of marginalized identities in culture and narratives. Both fields emphasize the importance of challenging normative assumptions, promoting visibility and empowerment, and recognizing the intersections of identity. By exploring the intersections of crip theory and queer narratology, scholars can foster a more inclusive and transformative understanding of disability, queerness, and the power of storytelling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zira, for that paper. We have the last presenter here for this session, Moses Lanunfela. His paper is entitled Breaking Boundaries, Examining the Story of Nidhi Goel. Moses Lanunfela is an alumni of our department and is an independent researcher. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so before I start, um, it's late now and I'm, and I'm the only last presenter left, so I hope we are not, you know, uh, bored or sleepy yet, right? Okay, so before I start, I would like to add a very little thing, okay? One thing I would like to add is that I have been told by some people that after my presentation is over, they are going to be asking me very, very difficult questions. So I would like to add to that is that bullying is wrong, okay? And we should stop that right now, okay? Okay, so my title today is Breaking, Breaking Boundaries, Examining the Story of Nidhi Goyal, okay? And Nidhi Goyal is, uh, you know, 
a disabled person, she's blind, and she's also, you know, a very, uh, human rights ex activist. She, uh, she even, you know, she's one of the uh, core, let's say, she's one of the core human rights activists in India today. And the reason why she's not that famous or the reason why she's not in the mainstream media is because uh, she refuses you know, all these interviews with uh, all these mainstream media so that she, uh, she says that, no, I'm only going to help these people. I don't want this, or, uh, you know, publicity for myself. And she, she's also the founder of an NGO, uh, NGO called Rising Flame. She's the founder of this uh, NGO, and it's based in, in based, it is based in Mumbai. And, you know, it helps. Uh, yeah, this, the purpose of this NGO, NGO is to help all these, you know, uh, disabled people, not just disabled people, but also women who are very, very dis disenfranchised in our country. But unlike, uh, you know, most disabled people, uh, Nidhi Goel was born a, nor a, normal, uh, a normal person, okay? She was uh, uh, a normally healthy person. But when she was 17, she uh, you de developed this illness that uh, rendered her blind. And you know, uh, before we turn 50, uh, after we turn 15, let's say we are very, very, you know, it's when a person is actually starting her life, when, when she's actually uh, being self-aware of herself. And at that point, uh, when she had this blindness, she had to you know, traverse her life in a whole different way. And that's why she learned so many new things and the only, so many new things that a disabled person goes through. And what what she was most you know, surprised of was that uh, her father had a friend. He, he was also a doctor and he advised her father that, okay, your daughter is going to be blind and I think uh, nothing can change that. So you should hide her blindness, you should hide her disability and uh, after three years, marry her off without telling her you know, uh, husband's family. Because if you don't marry her off, nobody's going to marry her and she's going to be a burden to your family. She, a doctor was the one who advised this to Nidhi's father, but Nidhi's family was very, very supportive of, of her. That's why uh, he refused and he said, that, no, I'm going to give my daughter a very, very normal life. And then her supportive family is the reason Nidhi Goel claims that, okay, because of my family, I, I am able to do all this and that because, you know, they have been very, very supportive of me. And what she learned was that, you know, when, when she got this disability, when she developed this disability, she was very, very depressed. She was very, very anxious and confused. And uh, during this time, she was, you know, she did not know what to do. And what happened was uh, she met, uh, she had this spiritual master. Her, his name was Sri Guru, Bal, uh, Guru Balaji Tambe. Okay, and he actually advised, uh, he actually made Nidhi Goel see the positive, the positive aspects of her disability. He told her that, okay, uh, you cannot change your disability anymore, but what you have, not many people have, is that you have a very, very supportive family and they are willing to help you out with, uh, help you out with every aspect of your life. And Nidhi Goel realized that, okay, there are so many women, so many children, so many people in India that do not have that same, you know, support, supportiveness of her family. So she, she says that, uh, she learned that she, uh, she became conscious of her privilege and took an oath that she would create a support that she was fortunate enough to have for women with disabilities like her. And then she, you know, like uh, yesterday, like uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Sati said, he, he, you know, experienced all this, uh, uh, all these things when he is a disabled person, like when he was in a restaurant, people would ask his son what he was eating and all, all that. Nidhi Goel also went through all these things. And because she was a woman, her, you know, she was judged uh, not just as a disabled person, but as a woman herself. And that's why she says that disabled person are pitiable and a disabled person is either superhuman or or very, very pitiable, okay? A superhuman when, you know, when a disabled person does something, you know, like Nidhi Goel, she's a very, very uh, well-renowned, you know, social activist, uh, activist in India. Not just her, there are so many uh, disabled people that are, you know, doing so many good things for others, like uh, the uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, his uh, uh, known worldwide, Helen Keller, who is a very, very uh, good inspiration for many, uh, many people. So Nidhi Goel says that unless when, um, 
disabled person does something, you know, that is very out of their, their realm, then they are, you know, considered superhuman, they are praised and everything. But when they are, you know, just, uh, they come from a, a very, very uh, normal family and, uh, you know, they had to, to traverse all, to all these things, they are very pitiable and they are looked down upon. And Nidhi Goel is, you know, very, very, as, as a person, she's, uh, you know, very, very bright, you know, and he, she's very bright and talkative and all these, all these characters, her characters, her personality is very, very bright and what she does and what she, uh, you know, and captures people around her. When people are around her, you know, it, it's not matter that she, she's a disabled person herself, you know, people are, uh, happy people are, you know, they, they don't even see her disability anymore because she can em uh, encompass everyone around her. And then she says that she has experiences that animal without a disability will not have. So she's very, very pos positive, right? And then she says that, okay, I am blind, but my experiences, the things that I've experienced, no normal person, let's say, no people with a sight, no uh, people who can, who can see, they cannot, they do not know what I have experienced. That's why my experience are very, very valuable to me. And there are more people out there who does not have the same, uh, same experiences as me. That's why I'm very, very lucky. And, And she says that just because, she, you know, when, when she developed this disability, she started to see that how people treat, you know, uh, these disabled peoples. She says that people don't see me first. They see my cane. They see a disabled person's wheelchair. They see a disabled person's whatever that they have. Maybe they're blind, maybe they're deaf. That is what people base their whole personal personality off of. They don't see them as a person. They see her with a cane and that cane is her as a person. And that is what, she says that uh, I, uh, I have to, I had to deal with all these people. And when I was dealing with this, when, when my di disability developed, I did not know how to, you know, how to traverse through these people, how to answer these people, how to, you know, educate these people. And she, she had to, you know, uh, suffer, let's say. She had, she had to go through, go through this all the time. And then she, uh, she said that, she says that women with disabilities are not considered women in love because, you know, like I said before, even a doctor himself advised Nidhi Goel's, Goel's father that if you don't marry her off and if you don't hide her disability, no one is going to marry her. So she says that, she says that a disabled woman, a disabled person, not just uh, a woman is not considered disabled enough because, you know, because she's disabled, she's reliant. And that's why a reliant person, a reliant person like her cannot, you know, have a child, cannot look after a child. That's why it's better that she does not marry and she does not have a child at all. And that's all, all the comments that she gets. And all these comments that she gets, it's not just from, you know, yeah, uneducated people. It's from very, very educated people, very, very well-to-do people. And that's why she was very, very confused. How is it that people who are so, who act so civilized, who are so educated, how is it that they are so unaware of uh, the things that disabled people are going through? And then she says that women with disabilities are considered seekers of care, just like I said before, you know, they, they are seekers of care. And then that's why this whole thing that she was going through, so she says that, okay, I have been going through all these things in my life, I'm going to change this. That's why I'm going to work with other women, I'm going to help women like me, and I'm going to empower them. She, that's why she started her activism. But when she started her activism, she was, you know, most of her activism was about the betterment for girls with disabilities and to work on their sexual and reproductive health and rights. So she was, you know, very unaware of what was, uh, what was, uh, what working on sexuality and sexual rights would mean in society. She was very, very unaware of what was going to happen. You know, as a girl, as a single woman, what would happen if she would start working for this, you know, sexual rights. So she. Uh, she received backlashes. She uh, she was accused of elitist activism because she speak English and is a single young woman. So she was called desperate. Okay, she she had she was called names. She was called all these things because okay, Nidhi Goel can only talk about sex. Okay, uh, she's a young woman. That uh, she, that's why she's desperate and that's why she can only talk about sex. So all these things, you know, all these uh, all these people were commenting about her about about all these things about her. So. 
she found that very, very strange was because, no, I'm, uh, she says that I'm, you know, actually fighting for the rights of uh, women with disabilities. Why is it that people are actually uh, uh, concentrating on the things that are not necessary at all? And that's why uh, the thing about Nidhi Goel is she's very, very witty, right? She's very, very witty, and that's why she would, you know, answer them in a very, very strange and uh, up-forward way. So one of her co-workers uh, told her that words have been going around that Nidhi Goel can only talk about sex. So uh, Nidhi Goel uh, at that moment she was very very surprised and confused and then she was also angry and that's why she just uh, answered that okay so you're saying I can only talk about sex what about doing it right so what about doing it so when she answered it like uh, like that people around her they did not know how to answer her at all so nidhi goel found out that okay if i you know i don't have to be silent anymore if people are saying something then i should say something back but because you know she did not want to come off as this you know um, rude person so she turned to comedy okay she turned to comedy and what you have to know is that nidhi goel is the first female disabled comedian from India. She's, she's a stand-up comedian, okay? And she says that I'm going to use comedy as a way to tell people the truth. You know, the, uh, comedy is the uh, easiest, surefire way of, you know, telling people things without actually offending them. That is uh, what most stand-up comedians do. And that's what Nidhi Goel started, to, uh, started doing. She she started writing her own skits. She started doing this uh, uh, stand-up comedy. And when she and when she was doing this stand-up comedy, she realized that, okay, it's a very, very effective way of actually educating the people, okay? I, I am not insulting them. She, she was using satire, okay? She was not directly insulting them, but she was, actually, she was actually educating them. And because people were laughing at the same time, they were actually listening to her. And, and because of that, you know, uh, little by little change was coming. And Nidhi Goel was then able to, you know, and... Uh, able to do her activism in a way that was never seen before okay the, i don't think there there's been much activism out there you know for for women uh, for women as a whole for women with disabilities for children with disabilities who are you know very very disenfranchised in our country and she also says that in a country like india where there's uh, the caste system is so so prevalent if a dalit woman is uh, is a disabled person. Let's say she's a disabled person and if she is a victim of rape, no one is going to believe her. Why? It's because first she's a Dalit woman and second she's, uh, she's disabled. So uh, how is it that this uh, disabled person can tell you that she was raped or not, right? So all these things were going around and Nidhi Goel saw all through that. So she, she you know, uh, through her uh, NGO, through Rising Flame, uh, her, she aimed on, you know, getting rid of all these things. And it actually, actually very, very, uh, very much helped that she was doing this true stand-up comedy because stand-up uh, stand comedy then became a very, very powerful tool for her. And because of that, she was uh, helping people and she was also entertaining them and making them laugh. And she, she even performed in the Canvas Love Club, which is, you know, the uh, top of uh, Indian comedy today. If you uh, if you are a stand-up comedy fan, a comedy fan, you will know that you know the people like Kunal Kamra and people like uh, all these. Uh, what's his name? Siddharth. I, I forgot his name. Sorry. So he, he was. All these people would you know stand uh, stand on there, and she was uh, uh, she was with them, and then the person uh, who was you know supp uh, supposedly a disabled person was the brightest in the room she was uh, making other people laugh she was you know uh, she was garnering att garnering attention and she was actually doing more for people than uh, all these let's say so called celebrities okay and she says that because i am blind i garner so much attention the minute i walk into a room everyone is looking at me Everyone is talking about me, and that's why she used that into her own, you know, uh, into uh, her own betterment. She she used that. She she used her disability to fight for other people with disabilities. So, in conclusion, in conclusion, I would like to add that Nidhi Goel's story is one of resilience, determination, and hope. She has broken boundaries and reshaped the discourse around gender issues and disability in India. She has inspired a new generation of activists and advocates who, like her, are working towards a more just and equal society. Nidhi's work as an activist is an example of how individuals can make a difference and create 
positive change even in the face of adversity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moses, for your paper. Rinwani, uh, Malsoma, Zira, and Moses, the four of y'all, for a moderator and for somebody who's chairing a session, all of y'all have stuck to the time so well. You're a moderator's dream. Thank you so much. I didn't even have to remind y'all uh, that time is up or anything of that sort. Now, uh, we all know the topics that uh, they have presented. You'll have it in front of y'all in your papers and they've announced it as well. So this is the time to ask questions. Uh, the mic will be passed around. For uh, We open the time now for questions, observations, and deliberations for all our uh, presenters. <clears throat> so this is for Sarva Soma. Uh, so one of the criticism of transhumanism is that uh, transhumanism ideology uh, pathologizes disabled people and that it strips man of his humanity. Is this something that you agree with? Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, that's a very good question. And in my reading of transhumanity, uh, what I have found is that most transhumanists feel that that is a misconception. Because according to the transhumanists, what they define as human and what uh, we, the, the normal, the average person calls human, is not the same. For transhumanists, a human is no longer all flesh and blood, as we know. So for transhumanists, uh, a human, there needs to be a new definition of a human. It is called the post-human. And so transhumanist main goal, their main aim, is to find a way to achieve that post-human state. Uh, which is why I have uh, concluded in my presentation as well that what transhumanists call disabled and what we know as disabled and what they know as normal, what we know as normal is no longer the same. They, have, they are trying to come up with a new definition is what I'm saying. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. My question is for uh, Sir Zir Sangliana. So, in your paper, uh, you mentioned that the term "crip" or "cripple" is considered a slur. And uh, as far as I know, uh, I could be wrong. Uh, Robert McCrewer, he never really discusses whether he himself is a disabled person or is queer. So, if that is the case, uh, do you think that he's a man of privilege uh, who is taking on the identities of others? So, if that is the case, do you think that um, he's using a condescending tone by uh, defining crip in a limited manner? All right. Thank you so much for the question. And, you know, when we talk about crip theories or queer theories or marginalized theories in general, it is a dangerous topic to discuss, actually, because when we try to sound academic, you know, you said Robert McGrew coming from a privileged background and all that. He is treading on dangerous path in that so many feelings can be heard. And that is the reason why I said in my presentation, if we're going to talk about representation of marginalized communities, we have to take into account their history, the, histi the historical historical context, where they come from and where they are now. And I'm not sure about McGrew's background, but what I can tell you is that crip or crip theory in general is uh, one of the most recent take that we can have as far as theory is concerned. And it, that is the reason why I use this theory as a part of my, you know, as a part of my research because it contains the latest data. Uh, thank you so much, uh, presenter. So my question 
I guess it's, it should be a question, I guess, uh, is for Malsoma uh, on uh, transhuman media. So I actually, um, thank you for bringing in the idea. I really liked it. So one of the questions that comes to my mind is that when we talk about transhuman and naturally, by extension, we also refer to posthuman, uh, there is a huge franchise here, I'm, aware, you're, I'm sure you're aware of, of um, the whole idea of the mutants. Right, the augmenting of the body for a certain reason, the creation of a new kind of, um, I guess, community of people who ha either serve or they want to create their own set of uh, population. So how do you, can you connect the two together when we talk about mut mutants, the kind of representation that we have in terms of body augmentation uh, to the idea of both posthuman and transhuman? Uh, and probably the idea of disability, which is now uh, now to be perceived in a whole new perception of uh, becoming better from the existing community uh, in terms of enhancing it for, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know, a society that perhaps we can only imagine uh, since we've not experienced it. So uh, would you be able to kind of bring the two together and look at it and maybe some comments on that? Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Yes, uh, so in, even within the, the, the field of post-humanism, there are two schools of thought in that there are those who believe we are already post-human. We are no longer the same. We, are already, we have already achieved that state. And there are those who believe we are still in the process, the transition phase. And... Uh, with the, the linking between this ability and transhumanism is, so suppose there's a disabled person, a person has lost their limb. And so the general idea would be to get a prosthetic limb, an artificial limb, which can apply for organs as well. And if that is the case, the artificial limb will be, of course, much stronger than flesh and blood limb. And if that is the case, then why doesn't everyone have this artificial limb? So that is the reasoning. So uh, that is the, the reason uh, why I have concluded here as well that, yes, if prosthetics are better, if they perform better, then why do only disabled people get them? Why shouldn't everyone get them is what I'm uh, coming at. I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, that's my answer for you. I have a question for uh, this is, uh, Lalrin Muani. Uh, very interesting paper, and you brought in the entire Japanese uh, uh, this uh, concept of uh, like I, I what I want to focus on is like it's a uh, more of a hypo ableist uh, perspective that you are looking at, and also in terms of um, material progression if we see japan is uh, at one of its in, in terms of technological development also it's uh, at at one of its like uh, it's at its peak in in the entire uh, world uh, thing so do you think uh, it's somewhere related this technological development which kind of uh, uh, gives them a protection against, they feel they are inured to any kind of disabled uh, uh, narrative that makes uh, disability, any form of disability, a greater threat to their community than probably uh, maybe if we compare it to our uh, situation here where we are used to uh, like uh, seeing a more uh, uh, disabilities at, uh, of various levels at a greater, at a closer perspective. So maybe, would you like to comment on that? Hello. Okay, thank you for the, the question and the comment. Uh, I do think that uh, since Japan is such a, a developed and in industrialized country, um, I do think that uh, the development and the industrialization, at the rapid speed at, at which it is taking place is also playing a huge part in this whole uh, disability perception. Um, uh, in 2014, there was this um, policy that was implemented by the government where um, the, the workers in offices or any other places in Japan had to have their stress check. So it was called a stress check and it was to further prevent and also kind of uh, deal with this 
the problem of uh, depression and this mental illness that was prevalent in workers in Japan. And uh, uh, as I've said in my paper, the, the, there is this mentality in Japan that uh, you have to be uh, productive, you have to do a certain amount of labor, and you have to contribute to the society in order for you to be viewed as like a, a normal productive uh, citizen. So there are so many, it, that, that concept creates so much uh, stress and pressure on the, uh, the workers, or the, not just the workers, but even the students as well, that there is like a, a collective national malaise or something like, uh, an outspread like a very in a, of mental illnesses. So I do think that uh, the the state at which Japan is in, I do think that it plays uh, a lot of role in the whole uh, mental illness and disability uh, prospect. Uh, we have time. We'll just have one question now. Does anyone have a question for Moses Lalunfela? I know that, uh, you know, he said no bullying, <laughs> but I'm sure nobody's going to bully him. Does anyone have a question for Moses Lennon Fela? And that will be the last question. Is there no question out here? Moses, I think you've really frightened the living. You, you, you were frightened, but now you succeeded in frightening them. Yes? Yes. <laughs> All right. No, because he said no bullying. That is why. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was a very good technical session. And, of course, the last of the sessions, session five. Thank you all for your patience and your questions. And thank you very much, everyone, for such wonderful papers. Very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we are closing the uh, session now. Uh, so uh, there's nothing much to do except the, the choir and the solo and also the giving out the certificates. Uh, so uh, first of all, I shall call upon Dr. Sila Rinzuala Amtea to present his song. For those who do not know my guitarist and is wondering who she is, she is one of our fourth semester students and we're very proud of her. She can play a lot of musical instruments and she's very talented. Yeah, we're, she used, ever since she was a little child, you know, a little girl, I mean, not a child, uh, she used to play for me and she's still doing that right now. So I'm very fortunate. So the song that I'm going to sing for you today is called, uh, I don't know, Tola Ding Dase. It's a song by V. Tangzama, and yeah, it's about Mizoram. <laughs> Eng vang e ilorum le Du tu leng sam Suava em loni Heti kava ilat le Si ar leng ma kyan lam duang an tuya si zang kwa abung buwe kantan kwa avar kofing lochate. Toru le ikal angu Tola ding te te Iliam adame Ita chum te a kyang e Lutiang oilo vin 
Ramkasiam te te Kwave Ile tinge ya Mahana Kanin mo Tinlai zingriade Min tim tu tu dar feng ruang ceng rang rola au kan muan puisi lo zanmur tina ye oh tholading te te. Ilia madame ita trumte a kiange nutiang hoi lovin ramkal siam te che kwavel ile tinge ya. Nutiang hoi lovin Ngil zai re li la Kan liam Lui te dam ro se Kwa a sang te le Kwa gan tla yeng e Du na Yani kalang u o Tola ding te te iliam Adame ita Chum te a kyang e Nu tiang hoi lo vi Ramkal siam te te kwave ila tinge ya kwave ila tinge ya. Thank you all. would like to have any say, comments or whatever. Just a few minutes. The paper presenters also. Anybody can just come forward. Yeah, at least some words of appreciation. It was really wonderful coming here and both the keynote speakers on both the days, they were so enriching. And the best part is you kept so well to the time. So I'm going back with a lot of positive experiences and this is my second time in Aizol. I'm really in, absolutely in love with the university and with your city both. So thanks a lot and a special thanks also to Christina for being like our escort throughout, the, throughout our stay here. She's been so good. And you have such wonderful student volunteers. I mean, they are an asset to the department. Thanks a lot, had a really, really wonderful time here. Thank you. I think all of us feel that we have had a day so uh, now I would uh, request Professor uh, Sarangadhar Baral to come forward for handing out the certificates. I will just uh, call out the names and then they will come here and they will take it from him. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Vipash Chaudhary, who has come for the keynote. Yeah, sorry. Lal Thangliana Jr. Mm -hmm. 
do I need to read out? Read out? No, he's gone. He's gone with uh, Professor Sati. Maybe. Professor Sati has gone. Okay, maybe we will give maybe it to him. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let and sang it out there. Dr. Christina, Dr. Christina. Michelle Leropui. Katupali Santaram. Sanjukta Naskar. Nabanita Sen Gupta Dr. Zeddilal Mangaizawa Nancy Lalimpui Rodin Pui Cesar Sangliana Dr. Janajit Singh Can learn over Pubaral's Pubaral's uh, certificate. Malsoma. Yeah. Moses Landon Fella. in Moani Professor Margaret Pachwal the convener Madam convener and Dr. Christina the co-convener co-convener madam Okay, thank you, Professor Baral. Yeah, you can. No, 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 this one. Yeah, that is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, before we have the vote of thanks, uh, we'll call upon the uh, choir, the, the uh, students of the department, uh, to present us with a song. to the dark hide away they say cause we don't want your broken parts I've learned to be ashamed of all my scars run away they say no one will love you as you are but
sending big waves into motion Like how a single word can make a heart open I might only have one match, but I can make an explosion All those things I didn't say, wrecking walls inside my brain Can you hear my voice this time? my fight song take back my life song prove I'm alright song this is brave this is proof this is who I'm meant to be this is me the is here I go Dr. Lalrin Zwala, who uh, guided them, who gave them the guide, so thanks to him. And he also rendered a very beautiful song today. Uh, so we have uh, come to the end, and now we are uh, left with only the vote of thanks, which will be uh, given by Dr. Annabel Lalshatpui. Please come forward. Uh, thank you, Professor Kesi. Uh, now, we have come to the end of our much-anticipated national uh, seminar on representations of disability in literature and culture. So, as you can see, uh, to organize an event as important as, as this requires the concerted efforts of so many individuals, which is why I have a long list of people to thank, but <laughs> I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Uh, first, I want to thank the convener. I don't know if uh, that is uh, something that I should say, but uh, the convener, Professor Margaret L. Patsau, who is also the head of the department, Department of English and Culture Studies, as well as the co-convener, Dr. Christina uh, Zedzama. They have been working around the clock for weeks, for months now, let's say, so that we may have a fruitful seminar. Thank you to the both of you. And um, <clears throat> I would also like to thank, on behalf of the organizers, <laughs> the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor uh, Debakar, sorry, Chandra Deka, uh, who was there to grace our inauguration yesterday. And we, uh, we feel blessed uh, and honored to have in our midst two literary giants. And these are Professor <coughs> Someshwar Sati from Delhi University and Professor Vibash Chowdhury from Guwahati University, who have made enormous contributions to, to the discourse of, on uh, sorry, disability studies. Thank you so much, sir, for inviting our humble invitation. Professor Somesh is in the guest house. He's not here with us. Thank you to the both of you. And we also expect to see you again very soon. And I want to thank the Dean, School of Humanities and Languages, 
Professor Saranga Darbaral and his staff. I want to mention over here that Professor Baral is playing a very uh, vital role in this seminar. Uh, <laughs> apart from allowing us to utilize this hall, the Dean's Seminar Hall, he has also chaired one of the sessions and also presented a paper. So thank you so much, sir. And I want to thank uh, the teaching faculty as well as the non-teaching staff and our students who have been very cooperative in helping us in the arrangements and putting up the banners and all the important activities that are required uh, uh, throughout the preparation and also throughout the seminar. Thank you everyone for your coordination. And I might as well mention James Lerempuya, our research scholar, was there to supervise all the activities. Thank you so much, James. Uh, and I also uh, want to state that we feel very blessed to have big, big talents in our department. And as you have just heard, uh, one of them is Dr. Sila Rinzuala Amtea. Uh, he has given us, you know, uh, he has shared with us his talents. Uh, thank you so much, Amtea. And we also have Silo Tangliana Jr., who apart from his academic input, uh, because he presented a paper yesterday as well, um, <clears throat> he has been working tirelessly behind the camera, all right, so that we can save so many fond and beautiful memories uh, throughout the seminar. Thank you so much, Junior. Uh, I think they're both outside. And I would also like to thank members of the choir. We all witnessed their um, stellar performances <laughs> Right, so uh, they invested so much time and effort practicing their songs. And apart from that, I would I like to mention uh, that there are two very important individuals behind their marvelous performances. And these are Professor Margaret El Patsuao and Dr. Sila Rinzala, because they have been overseeing all their practices. <laughs> That's true. Mm, giving them all the financial and technical support that they need. So thank you so much, ma'am and Dr. Amtea. Mm. And there are so many people, groups of individuals who have been working behind the scenes so that we can have a successful uh, seminar. And uh, these are, uh, first of all, uh, Chef, uh, sorry, uh, Foodwise Asia. They have been uh, preparing sumptuous meals for us during these two days. And apart from that, the canteen, uh, School of Humanities and Languages, and uh, staff of the guest house, who not only uh, prepared tea and snacks for us, but they have been really hospitable, and they have been <coughs> ex uh, sorry, <coughs> very good to our guests as well. And all of us, I think, uh, we experienced that yesterday. And I also like to thank MB Sound, Pumabiaka, and his team of experts. They have been here with us throughout not just the seminar, but two days prior, so that we can have the best sound system possible. Thank you so much. And uh, we have a team of experts from the PR cell, uh, Missouri University, uh, Mr. Omar uh, Van Tsong and his uh, peers. Thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, I may have uh, missed a few names. Uh, I'm sorry if I uh, have missed out uh, any names, but I just want to thank each and every one of us, uh, all the audiences uh, for uh, coming here today, not just today, yesterday as well, for being here uh, throughout this seminar. And I almost missed the most important groups of people who made this seminar such a success. And these are uh, the group of presenters Right. Uh, thank you so much for making this seminar a success. We have presenters, in-house presenters. We have presenters uh, who are researchers and faculty members from different parts of Mizoram. And we also have a number of presenters from outside the state who have traveled all the way uh, to Mizoram so in order to make their contributions and uh, to help disseminate the important discourse on uh, disability studies. Thank you so much, each and every one of you. You made this seminar so much wonderful, and, and we, we hope, hope to see, see you all again very soon. <laughs> so, uh, with that, uh, I thank every one of you once again. All right, thank you, and God bless. <laughs>